Well, we're going to hear a lot more from the participants in those programs today, but just those short clips conveys the reach that these programs can have, both geographically, you saw students from Afghanistan to Africa, and demographically, you saw the age range. And as such, they really represent the next logical extension in these times of breathtaking technological innovation of the face-to-face -face international exchange programs that are unquestionably one of the greatest success stories in our public diplomacy. And yet, despite impressive efforts to expand the numbers by the administration and Congress, currently less than 2% of Americans in higher ed are able to study abroad. And those who do go to Europe by a large margin instead of to regions where we need to get a lot smarter if we're going to get better at avoiding conflict. And in fact, just last week, we learned that the State Department had to put the brakes on uh, the in-person youth exchanges program that we've had with Mali because of the dangers in that country. The world is not waiting. There is new urgency for us to maximize constructive cross-cultural engagement. People are connecting online more than ever before, but not always positively. Indeed, sometimes with disastrous consequences. Our public diplomacy leaders, who we are very fortunate to have joining us today, have enthusiastically embraced the new technology platforms with virtual town halls, Skype dialogues, lots of social media networking. So why do Exchange 2.0 programs continue to lag behind in the world of exchanges? Many believe that it is misconceptions around potential impact that most simply don't know if they can really be effective in shifting attitudes, which is why this is the focus for today's meeting, to look closely at both the potential impact of Exchange 2.0 programs and what we would need to do to scale them. I'm going to turn the podium over to our president in a moment. First, just a quick bit of housekeeping. We try to practice what we preach in terms of new media and global citizenship, and today's session will be streamed live. You can find it at usip.org. And if you're online, we've got multiple ways you can interact with the panelists and with each other. Uh, you'll see on our webcast page a chat box as well as a streaming Twitter discussion. You can participate via Twitter using our hashtag for the day, hash exchange 2.0. And when we go to the Q&A session, I'm going to go to my colleague, Anand Varghese, down here, who will relay your questions to the panelists. So those of you online, we really want you to know you're a core part of the event. Please lean in. We'd also like to thank the State Department for carrying the live stream on their homepage as well and for live tweeting the event. And with that, let me hand the podium over to our president, Jim Marshall. Everybody here knows that the world has become more and more and more interdependent, and yet at the same time it is not very well integrated. And as a result, what we'll see are disruptions that shouldn't occur, and these disruptions will cause a lot of pain for people. Uh, anything that we can do that improves the world's integration, understanding between people, is something that will improve the globe dramatically in the years to come. And it's something that's critically important. And as Sheldon points out, only 2% of our population participates in people-to-people -people exchanges. It's too expensive. And when they do, when we do, we typically go to the same old places, places that are safe, not the places in the globe where we really need to make contact, places where we really need to understand what's going on. We need to have people that we're talking with there. And at the same time, they need to understand us better. I think that uh, Exchange 2.0 holds out enormous pro uh, promise in this regard. Uh, and, uh, and, and I'm just uh, uh, delighted that we are able to host this uh, event today and hope that uh, we'll be doing a lot more of this in the future. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce a fellow Princetonian, Queen Noor. Uh, she graduated in 1974. I graduated in, in 1972. She is the first uh, American to become an Arab queen, uh, American-born uh, individual to become an, an Arab queen. And she... Uh, throughout her life has worked to improve cross-cultural understanding. Uh, she's done it in many, many ways, and she continues to do that today. Uh, we're very pleased that you're here uh, today, Your Majesty, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to Queen Noor.
Good morning. <laughs> oh no, you're right. <laughs> I'm so, I didn't. I came from the Middle East not too long ago, so I'm still a little bit confused. I do apologize. <laughs> All right, I'll start again. Good afternoon, and to wherever we're live streaming, whatever time of the day it is, uh, it is a great um, privilege and also um, pleasure to join with you all uh, today. I want to thank Congressman Marshall and Sheldon, the United States Institute of Peace, and the Exchange 2.0 Coalition for inviting me, um, and all of our fellow peace builders for inviting me to be here today. Uh, over the um, past decades of my public service, I've been privileged to serve many causes about which I I care deeply, whether um, nuclear and weapons of mass destruction, non-proliferation efforts, or sustainable development, human rights, cross-cultural understanding, and the dream for which my husband gave so much of his energy, commitment, and courageous leadership, peace in the Middle East. And in the search for real progress in addressing these seemingly in a in intractable and, and very complex challenges, it seems to me that today more than ever, the key lies in something that sounds pretty banal and obvious, communication. But it, it's today's radical changes in who communicates and how that are creating both greater urgency for all of us and opportunities. Um, as much as some may cling to it still, the win-lose framework for solving problems, if it ever was truly viable to begin with, which I personally doubt, is dead. In our truly interlocked and interdependent world, where every single challenge we face requires communication, negotiation, and collaboration across our diverse cultures and perspectives, the win-lose approach yields only lose-lose outcomes. On virtually every front, we are in this together, whether we like it or not. And so we must learn how to better understand and respect our differences while drawing upon that which we have in common to craft solutions to our shared problems that meet the basic needs and uphold the fundamental dignity of every single person. In today's world, it is no longer solely the political leaders and diplomats who set the course for how our societies and cultures relate to one another. There is now a much larger pool of influencers, and it is populated by bloggers, amateur video, video producers, religious leaders, outspoken commentators of all stripes, and countless others. Think with me about what these two realities of the modern world taken together signify. If we can only survive and thrive through collaborative problem solving, and if it is increasingly up to the common citizen, not just the practice politician or trained diplomat, to influence whether our societies clash or cooperate, well then we have a daunting challenge in front of us. We need to scale up the number and diversity of people worldwide, and we've seen an example of how that can be done, who have both the skills and the inclination to communicate constructively and collaborate practically across their differences. Unless you doubt me, I urge you to consider the alternative, because the world is not waiting for us. The common citizen is already serving as the ambassador, and too often with disastrous consequences. People all over the Muslim world know who Terry Jones is. A pastor in Florida with fewer than 50 congregants has become a lens through which millions of people are coming to know America. More recently, he has been joined by Nakula Nakula, an amateur videographer intent, like Jones, on inflaming hatred. As an American native, these are not the voices I want to see representing this country abroad. 
Meanwhile, the Muslim figures through whom millions of Americans have their first exposure to Islam are very, very rarely the learned figures and scholars revered and respected across the Muslim world. More often than not, they are the most radical and extreme voices of men like Osama bin Laden or Omar Abdul Rahman, the blind cleric who plotted the bombing of the World Trade Center in 1993. As a Muslim, these are not the voices I want representing my faith abroad. We cannot afford for these people to continue as the only de facto ambassadors of our societies to one another. And we cannot rely on connections between elites alone to build and maintain the peace between our societies. We cannot afford to wait for a complete breakdown in international relations in order to make a breakthrough to a more peaceful world. Whether you care about public diplomacy, international education, or simply want to live in a more peaceful world, I can assure you we will not have peace until we inculcate what it takes to build peace into the hearts and minds of a vastly larger and more diverse number of people around the world. Again, I think the film clip said it much better than I can. Unfortunately, despite the valiant efforts of so many in this room, physical exchange programs still engage less than 2% of our populations, and the vast majority of those do not choose to exchange with societies and cultures with which our biggest misunderstandings and tensions lie. The good news is that we have the means at our disposal to meet this challenge head on, and that gives us a unique opportunity. The unprecedented connectivity enabled by the internet, connectivity that, while not yet universal, is expanding and becoming more dense with every passing day, makes something extraordinary eminently possible. With these communications tools at our disposal, it is now within our power to take as great a stride towards cross-cultural respect, cooperation, and peace as we have ever taken at any other moment in history. But to seize this opportunity, we cannot rely on connections alone. The explosive growth of Facebook, Twitter, and other online networks is an extraordinary thing. But connection alone assures us nothing. After all, it is these same means of communication and connection that extremists exploit to take messages of hate global. No, the challenge is in scaling up connections with respect, connections that foster the attitudes and develop the skills with which a more peaceful world can be built. And this is why I'm so heartened by our meeting today. I know that organizations like Solia, IEARN, and Global Nomads Group, among others, have done the hard work of establishing models of virtual exchange. The programming that achieves exactly the kind of impact we need in the world. Opening up the possibility that we can finally expand access to exchanges, not for hundreds, thousands, or even hundreds of thousands, but for millions of young people. I've seen for myself the power of some of these exchanges. Good programs like those run by the virtual exchange providers present here today. They're not superficial web, web chats, but carefully designed and tested models that make participants truly present with one another in authentic, open dialogue. Over the course of a single semester, the caricature or stereotype of the other a person has in his head gives way to personal bonds with real, complex, relatable individuals who are representative of rich cultures and nuanced societies. Suspicion and fear melts away to be replaced with genuine curiosity about the other and a newfound humility in one's own perspective. What once was foreign and threatening begins to become interesting and exciting. And what was once assumed as fact 
is suddenly seen in a new light. These are not fleeting experiences, but rather shifts in perspective that have profound implications for how difference is viewed in the future. Indeed, they are the very shifts that physical exchange programs have enabled for decades, but you needn't take my word for it. In a moment, my friend Professor Sachs will share insights from her cutting edge research, which is always fascinating, into the question of what impact we need to have in order to shift someone's approach to the other from one of suspicion, fear, and disdain to one of interest, curiosity, and ultimately respect. I'm very much looking forward to this, and as, as I always do, to hearing her share the pro progress she and her colleagues at MIT have made in testing the impact of virtual exchanges, not only on these attitudes and perspectives, but also on the skills required for cross-cultural communication and collaboration. Because ultimately, if we have proven models for producing such impact through virtual exchange programs that are cost efficient and scalable, then it is clearly possible that such programming could become a fundamental part of education in the coming decade, enabling potentially millions of new relationships of genuine respect to be fostered across the divides where they are most needed. Imagine for a moment what that kind of world would look like. What if young people in the Arab world had personal exposure to caring, moderate voices from other countries to show them that bigotry and religious intolerance are no more than fringe values? And what if our next generation of American policymakers, journalists, and religious leaders had Arab and Muslim friends, partners, or colleagues? the world would never be the same. The extremists in our societies would be forced back to the extremes, and relations between us would finally come to be characterized by cooperation and compassion rather than confrontation and coercion. Now, I know from the organizers and my friends in Exchange 2.0 co Coalition that the reason you were invited here today is because we need your help to make this happen. Governments, technology companies, civil society organizations, and concerned citizens all have critical roles to play. And so as the program unfolds today, I would ask you to do two things. First, shed any preconceived notions you might have of what an exchange is. We cannot afford to approach peace building solely based on traditional communication models particularly when new generations are increasingly using other means to share information, meet new people, and develop relationships. Instead, let us focus on the underlying change we are seeking to achieve, the change that Rebecca's research is trying to uncover and measure. Let us make positive use of these new communications media, tapping the ingenuity and expertise of everyone here to find new ways to employ them at a scale that is equal to the urgent challenge we face. And second, commit to work together toward the goal of reaching not hundreds or even thousands, but millions of people at a formative age. Because I firmly believe that only this will address the urgent challenge presented by a world in which new technologies amplify voices across borders and every citizen is a potential media outlet and de facto ambassador for better or for worse. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Majesty. You've sounded the call to action loud and clear, setting the stage perfectly, I think, for the rest of the program and especially for our next speaker. As I said earlier, we believe one of the reasons that Exchange 2.0 programs have not received the attention nor the resources they should has been misperceptions around their potential impact. Most people simply don't know 
how effective they can be, and they wonder, rightfully so, can web-based international cross-cultural exchanges really foster meaningful dialogue, shift attitudes, and build the skills that are needed in today's interconnected world? So to help us answer this really important question, we've brought to Washington uh, Rebecca Sachs, who you've just heard the Queen mention. Rebecca Sachs is a very talented neuroscientist who's been doing pioneering research in her lab at the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences at MIT on just this issue. Rebecca's full bio is in the printed materials you have, fortunately, because I couldn't do it justice in just a few lines. In 2008, she was named one of Popular Science's um, Popular Science Magazine's Brilliant Ten Scientists Under 40, and in 2012, the World Economic Forum named her a young global leader. Ladies and gentlemen, it is really an honor to give you Rebecca Sachs. Thank you. In a second. Um, well, it's totally an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, in my normal life, I'm a neuroscientist. I study the function of the healthy human brain. Um, for example, that's my brain. It looks fine. <laughs> and um, my work is normally looking at the aspects of human cognitive function that makes human beings unique. Our capacity um, for thinking about other people, for communicating in language, and for making moral judgments. So in my lab, we typically study how these brain regions function in a population we call typical human adults. They're MIT undergraduates. <laughs> so what am I doing here? A few years ago, when I first met um, the people who work at Celia, I saw an opportunity to use science not only to ask what I think are some of the deepest questions about the nature of the mind, but also to use that science to make an impact on some of the most important questions and challenges that our society faces. And so I got involved uh, in the Science of Exchange 2.0. Um, this is all research I'm doing with a colleague, Emil Bruno. Um, as we've heard already and as we will continue to hear in today's um, panel, it is already clear that Exchange 2.0 is cheaper than real exchange and is becoming technically feasible with the incredible expansion of the web. So the question that I came here to talk about is, OK, it's cheap and it's feasible, um, but is it effective? And this is where I see the key role of science is in uh, testing this question. So how should we figure out whether Exchange 2.0 is effective. Um, and I'll just briefly say what I think uh, can be the rules for a scientific approach, um, in part using an analogy from baseball. So ho I hope many of you have read Michael Lewis's book, Moneyball, or seen the movie. Um, and this is an account of how um, science transformed another key American uh, challenge, namely winning games in baseball. So the first thing is that the first thing that we learned from baseball and actually over and over again in psychological science is that to make progress in hard problems, you need to get beyond human intuition. Even incredibly well-trained and well-meaning experts who want the best baseball team they could have or the best diplomatic core of the future don't actually know what it takes to win a baseball game only from intuition and can't pick the, the educational solutions that work just from intuition. So we can be systematically wrong going by intuitions and instead need quantifiable measures. Um, in this case, the intuition was that what it took to be a baseball player um, was a certain kind of physique, a certain way of walking into the room, and a certain number of home runs per game in a high school baseball tournament. The second thing that science can do is help us figure out not only what works, but how it works. And I'm going to talk more a little bit about the psychological science behind the exchange programs um, that the Exchange 2.0 partners have been working on. Um, but the third thing is by um, forcing these partners to clarify what outcomes they're trying to achieve. Certainly what we as scientists spend a lot of time in the room with Exchange 2.0 partners working on is to clarify what is it we're trying to measure. And again, I'll talk more about that here. What's the outcome we're going for? This was the key change in baseball, was recognizing that what baseball teams wanted was not a certain number of home runs per player over the season, 
but to win the most baseball games. And it turned out that if you wanted to win baseball games, you didn't want just 50 home runs in a season. You wanted the players who got on base. And that was a totally different look for a baseball team. And I think we're talking about an analogy here to a totally different look for a, base, for a diplomatic corps. Instead of the one person who hits the home run, we want all of the little people who get on base however they get there. Um, finally, in addition to knowing what we're trying to achieve in the long run, we need to figure out what are the measures that we can take that figure out whether we're making the progress in the moment. And again, I'm going to talk about that in more detail for Exchange 2.0. How can we achieve fast and cheap, but also objective and culturally neutral measures that tell us what kind of success we're having uh, in the moment, similar to the development of measures like on base percentage for baseball. And basically what we want is a common currency for effectiveness that will let us measure how a component of a program or a whole program or a whole exchange is having an impact in, a mo in the moment that will predict the impacts we care about over the long run. So that's the goal. And uh, so starting now with mechanisms of change. What can the psychology and neuroscience um, that we've been developing uh, over decades tell us about possible mechanisms by which both physical exchange and virtual exchange can change the way that a person thinks? Um, and here I think that the first important lesson is that um, while playing together can make a difference, Working together is better than playing together. If you look at changes in the way that one group thinks about another, teams that have put, been put together to work towards a common goal end up trusting one another and also trusting members of the other group more generally, more than just groups of people who have sat together and hung out and enjoyed a beer. This is particularly true in a context that really matters for the public diplomacy challenges that Queen Noor was just talking about, which is when the groups that are coming together don't come from a shared history with equal status and equally supportive institutions. So while sitting together of a hummus or a beer can do a lot for two groups of people with shared status and a common history, if you have asymmetries of power and unshared histories, then it turns out that you can make much, a much bigger difference by giving people a task to solve, and in particular, one that focuses on the specific challenges that their history poses. The second lesson is that you don't always have to be speaking up to be making a difference. Just being there already changes the way that other, the other side is thinking about your group. Some of the most dramatic examples of this come from beautiful studies by Sam Summers of juries, showing that homogenous juries work less well than heterogeneous juries, not because the lone minority member is always responsible for standing up for the viewpoint of their group, but because everybody, all the members of the jury, even the majority members of the jury, are more open to other perspectives just because there's somebody there from the other group making that perspective more salient and available. So now we have in an Exchange 2.0 situation, you can imagine people with a task to work on in the classroom, with people even just being there from the other group, rendering those perspectives more salient. And the third lesson is that those impacts magnify beyond the people in the room. So there's evidence that having a friend from another group makes a difference, but actually even knowing that your friend has a friend from another group can have a big impact on how members, for example, of a dominant group think of a disadvantaged or minority group. And so we get a chance to impact not just the people in the room, but their extended network. And the final lesson actually comes from very basic cognitive science from the study of memory. It turns out that the impact that you have on learning new information is magnified by learning that new information again after a break. So you might have the intuition that the best way to learn information is to do one in intense concentrated bout of study, which is called mast study. That is when you do all of one thing, and then all of another, and then all of another. And people who have done this kind of studying, that is studied all of their calculus before they turn to biology, report feeling more prepared for their exams, more fluent with the material. 
but their intuition is wrong. They actually would have done better to do a little calculus and then a little biology and then a little geometry and then go back to a little calculus. It turns out that doing what's called spaced study, studying something for a little bit, taking a break and going back to it, is better for the impact of basic educational uh, interventions and may also be better for the impact of cultural exchange. So here again is a big opportunity for Exchange 2.0 where people can have an intense interaction with members of another group, leave and go back to their lives and come back again the next day for a little more of that spaced exposure. So that's some reason to think Exchange 2.0 would work. Um, but now what we want to know is, well, how can we measure whether it does work and how its impact compares to those of other kinds of um, e educational and exchange programs? Um, so how can we measure the change that an intervention program has? Historically, this has been a big challenge. Mostly, people trust the intuition that it feels like it's working, so it must be working. Um, so there's actually very little history of studying the effects of exchange. When there is a, a study of the efficacy, it's usually through self-report measures, asking people to say things like, after this program, I feel like I can communicate better across cultural barriers. And there's a lot of problems with self-report measures. For example, imagine if that's how you staffed your baseball team. Or if that's how you figured out how good kids were at math, you ask them, I feel comfortable with math problems. Of course, what we want is for the kids to do the math, not to tell us how they feel about it. And similarly, we want measures that assess effectiveness by having kids do the cross-cultural activities that we're trying to change them for. There's actually even a perverse side of asking people how good they are at cultural exchange that comes from something Queen Noor just mentioned. One thing we want exchange to train is humility. And so you might want people after the program to recognize their limitations and self-report that they are less good than they thought they were, um, making it look like a program is having the opposite effect when actually what we're doing is bringing a broader perspective. Okay, so we want not just self-report, but um, some kind of measure of what kids can do, and also we want to compare them across programs or across uh, not having any uh, program at all. This is famous in medical contexts where it's critically important to evaluate any new medical intervention against both existing treatments and placebo controls. Um, so that's what we're aiming for scientifically. Um, I should say, though, that there are key challenges here. It's really important if you propose to invent quantitative measures that you measure the right thing. Because, for example, if what you measure, if you want kids who are good, for example, at using math in the real world, and what you measure is their performance on multiple choice test questions, you may not do a good job of capturing their capacity to translate that knowledge outside of the exams. In fact, what you might want to do is give them the equations and see how they do applying those in the real world. On the other hand, if what you want to measure is how well they will do on their GRE tests, then you, what you want to do is test them in exactly the context of their GRE tests. So if you're measuring the wrong thing, then of course you won't know what impact you're having. And I think a lot of the suspicion of using quantitative measurements to assess the impact of qualitative interventions like exchange comes from the perception that people who use quantitative measurements often use them badly. So let's assume we don't want to use them badly, but instead what we want is to design measures that tap into the change we're trying to achieve and also, we want tools that are easy to use, objective to score, and in particular, hard to fool. We want measures that don't have obvious right answers so that kids are trying to produce what they know we want to hear. This is called demand characteristics. Being a neuroscientist, of course, it occurred to me that what we should do is bring fMRI machines everywhere we go and look inside people's brains while they do these exchange programs. These machines, unfortunately, cost $10 million and weigh over a ton besides needing a shielded room, so this seemed impractical. Um, so I'm going to show you some of the progress we're making with much lower tech and cheaper tools. In fact, so low tech, they may look too low tech, and we are trying to push our way back towards experimental measures. Um, but even these really simple measurements give a sense of the impact that Exchange 2.0 is already having. Um, this research was done in collaboration with Celia, looking at the outcome of spending a semester online interacting um, with groups um, across America, Europe, um, and the Arab and Muslim world. Um, 
So um, this is a, a couple of pieces of low-tech current progress. The first dependent measure that we've been using is a measurement called self-other overlap. Oops. Oh, wow. You're getting a preview. <laughs> We'll get back there in a second. Okay. <laughs> You're not allowed to see it. Okay, here's our super high-tech measure. Not quite a brain scanner. It's actually just a set of circles. And people are asked to indicate how they feel about their relationship between themselves and a, and a group that we define just by sliding the two circles continuously together and apart. This is an incredibly simple measure about how people feel about another group and their relationship to it. But it's turned out to have actually amazing predictive power. So for example, in other experiments, how close you put the circle representing yourself to the circle representing the other has been shown to predict your generosity to them when real money is at stake, and even your willingness to take their place in an experiment that involves painful electric shocks, to take pain yourself to prevent them from experiencing the pain. So as people put themselves and the other into more overlapping configurations, they show more willingness um, to take on uh, pain for the other. Um, in American participants in Celia, what we found is that before they participated, they showed themselves completely overlapping with Americans, um, but not overlapping with Arabs and Muslims. One semester later, um, after Celia, uh, their, attitude, their uh, perception of the relationship between them and Arabs and Muslims had changed dramatically. Showing self-other overlap is um, probably really important in American participants, but there's reason to believe that that's actually not what we should be going for in the Arab and Muslim participants in the same exchange. And actually a really important lesson of the science of conflict um, and uh, intergroup interactions is that although it's extremely tempting, in asymmetric interactions between groups with asymmetric histories and powers, it's not a good idea to try to do the same thing for both groups initially. In fact, the two or more groups will come to the situation with very different needs. And imposing symmetry can be the worst thing that a well-intended intervention can do. Um, some of this evidence comes from research we conducted in the most minister exchange 2.0 intervention ever done. Um, this is an experiment that um, we conducted in Ramallah and Tel Aviv a couple of years ago, where we had participants come in for a 15-minute exchange. Okay, there's our participants. Um, so they had a 15-minute dialogue-based interaction be using a Skype video chat, um, before and after which we could measure their attitudes towards the outgroup. So again, this is a micro example of a much broader exchange program. The key thing here is that we were trying to do dialogue in a petri dish where we isolated one tiny component of a dialogue. And in this case, what we did is assign people to two asymmetric roles. One person was assigned to talk about their life experiences how, and how that affected them psychologically, the experiences that they had um, and that, that their group had. The other person was assigned to the listener role and was instructed um, to just hear what the speaker was saying and summarize it as best they could in their own words. Um, these were The participants were young adults um, living in Tel Aviv and Ramallah for whom physical exchange is basically impossible. It's illegal for them to talk to each other directly in one place. And so the opportunity to bring them together over Skype was a real uh, chance. Um, one of the things that we wanted to know is how did the attitudes of each group towards the other group change depending on the role we put them in compared to a control condition in which they didn't get a chance to interact? For Israeli participants, we found something similar to what had been reported in the literature before, which is that taking the other side's perspective, taking the chance to hear what they're saying and reflect on it and say it back in their own words, um, created a positive change in their attitudes um, towards Palestinians more broadly. Interestingly, we saw a really different pattern in the Palestinians. It was those Palestinians who had the chance to talk to the Israelis and specifically to feel heard, to have the Israelis say back to them what they had just said, who showed the most positive change in attitudes. And actually being asked to listen to an Israeli didn't have any positive effect at all. 
Um, this experiment suggested to us that a key thing to measure in broader exchanges is how effectively the exchange makes you feel listened to, heard by, and respected by the other group, especially for the non-dominant or less empowered side of a dialogue. Um, and so we've been measuring this again in Salia using still just a simple survey question. Here we've asked Arab participants in the Salia program, Arab and Muslim participants, how they feel about the statement when there's a conflict, Americans listen to my views, to my perspectives. Um, and what I'm going to show you is the change in that from before Salia to after Salia. And what we found is significant positive change. This is 14 points on a 100-point scale, so significant positive change in their perception that they are listened to. And the same thing when we asked whether um, the average American respects uh, Arab and Muslim culture. Again, a significant positive change. Another key thing that we've been measuring, which also comes from psychological research, is the perception of the other side as biased or irrational. And this comes from really important work done at Princeton by Emily Pronin, showing that once a dialogue starts or a conflict starts, there's a real danger of that dialogue actually sending the groups off in the wrong direction. This was, again, just highlighted by Quinur, that it's one thing to get people talking, but that can easily polarize the two sides into an increasing cycle of conflict. Emily Pronin has shown that this cycle occurs because when and two groups start initially disagreeing or somewhat polarized, the perception of the disagreement promotes the perception of the other side as irrational or biased, that their views must come not from a careful consideration of facts, but from self-interest and ideology. And the perception that their views are irrational and biased encourages people to prefer in the next move to choose coercive or violent modes of interaction over rational dialogue um, or uh, argument. Of course, one side choosing coercive or violent moves as the next step increases the perception of the other side of their polarization, expanding the difference between the two groups. And so a key role that exchange and dialogue ought to play is to, to try to put the brakes on the cycle, putting a wedge in the perception of the other group as biased and irrational. And so a key thing that we've been measuring is the perception of the other group as biased as opposed to forming their views based on careful considerations of the facts. And again, we're finding significant positive change from the Salia program on that measure. OK, so that's the survey measures that we've been using. Um, but now I'm just going to tell you a little bit about a new project. Uh, I don't have any results from this yet. It's just under works, but um, I'm very excited about it. Um, in part because surveys, as I said, are a little bit dangerous. There seems like there's an obvious right answer. Participants are motivated to say they've had a positive experience. And what we want are experimental measures where there aren't any incentives working against measuring the change we're really trying to make. And where, again, like baseball, we can actually watch the people we're training play the game that we're training them for. Um, so I'm going to give you a little IQ test that you can all try to do right now in your head, see how you're doing. So try to mentally rotate these triangles and put them into a square. Anybody got it yet? Okay, so a key thing about this task is that um, individuals can do this. You can rotate the, squares men the triangles mentally until they all form a square together. But if I put you in a group of three or four people to do this job, then there's two key things. One is that you do better than any one person alone. And the other thing is that your group's performance is not predicted by how smart the smartest person in the group is. It's not even related to how smart the smartest person in the group is. It's related to how good the group is at communicating and interacting. In case you haven't got it yet, here's the solution. <laughs> One of the key things that psychologists have found is that when individuals need to interact in a group with other people from an unfamiliar group or a group they find threatening or hostile, cognitive resources get used up monitoring those other group members and monitoring yourself and your behavior. And so you get what's called cognitively depleted, unable to use your working memory and cognitive resources for the task at hand. And so what we're working on right now is testing whether indeed this task picks up on the initial costs of working across boundaries with people you're frightened of or unfamiliar with, and then whether we can show that 
one of the benefits of exchange is speeding back up your performance so that a group made up of both American and Arab teenagers would again outperform the smartest member of that group on uh, collective intelligence tests like this. Um, so just to conclude, um, where are we going? What we're hoping for in terms of the science of virtual exchange is to develop a whole set of easy to use and hard to fool objective measures of the kind of change that we're trying to create. Um, that tools that can be um, used by anyone, um, ideally in a gold standard scientific design to measure both short and long term impact. So using random assignment control groups and blind uh, administration. These are the standards for evaluating the efficacy of a new drug, and so we think they should be the standards for evaluating the efficacy of a new intervention. Of course, that depends on our being able to develop the tools that measure the right thing. As soon as we have them, we would like these tools to be shared as freely as possible across all of the participants, not only in Exchange 2.0, but also in physical exchange, so that we can directly assess both the short and the long-term impact of all of these different kinds of tools, not only operating separately, but how they potentiate each other's impact when used together. And ideally, what we will have eventually is a common currency of the impact that Exchange is having both on the participants and on broader societies. Thank you. Um, yes, it's working. Great. So what I'd like to do is take some questions now uh, for Rebecca. We're re doing really well on time. Is anyone else thinking that if only their science classes had been like this, your life could have been completely different? At least that's what I'm thinking. Um, OK, so we're going to take some questions. And I know that we also have in the room a lot of experts, meaning a lot of teachers who have done these kinds of programs. And I'd love to hear from you all on what you're taking away from some of the things that Rebecca has talked about. So uh, raise your hands when you all um, would like to speak as well. OK, we've got questions down here. You want to bring? Here. I'm glad you thought that, Sheldon. I thought I was at a huge disadvantage bringing graphs to the institute. Come on over here. Come on over here. Thanks. Hi, Sheldon, and thanks so much, Rebecca. I'm uh, Cynthia Schneider, and I've been lucky to have Celia in my class for like five years now, in my diplomacy and culture class at Georgetown. And I'm going to give maybe a slightly more human size of, of measurement to this. I make kind of the motto of the class, which I think Celia has contributed to, so much to, that uh, something the Nigerian novelist Wale Soinka said, uh, culture humanizes what politics demonizes. And what I see happening with my students, which you alluded to, was is the introduction of nuance and gray in a very black and white world. And I see it also in the, I don't, I'm not allowed to listen, so I don't really see this, but I hear about it happening with the students that they interact with from the Middle East. Now, students at Georgetown are pretty sophisticated, and they go to school in an international environment. So you might say, what can they really learn? Well, let me tell you, it is a shock when they have a conversation with people who insist that Al-Qaeda was not responsible for September 11th. Uh, but then, conversely, the people on the other side have a real shock when they talk to someone who either actually suffered the loss of a family member or knows someone who did. So, you know, what they ultimately get to is not, you know, I'm right, you're right. What they ultimately get to is, why are you saying that? What is behind that belief? And so what Celia enables the students to do is to get beyond the news, to really understand each other as people. And I just have to emphasize, I really think the experiences they have talking about what they did over the weekend are just as important as the other experiences. Because then they really discover how much they have in common. 
But then a question might be, okay, but so how long does this really last? It's a one semester experience. Well, I would say in one of the earlier semester, two students met in that class and experienced dialogue in that class and then went on to found an NGO that works with Palestinian youth in refugee camps every summer called Inspire Dreams Palestine. And I think it was that experience of the impact of turning up, of them turning up and being there every year in Salia that had a strong impact. But the most impressive impact I actually just heard about recently when I had an email from a student who I'm embarrassed to say I couldn't actually totally remember, but uh, he took the class five years ago and he was writing me from Australia where he was engaged in the health industry and he had just seen an article I'd written on CNN and so responded and said, that's interesting that you're writing about Egypt. I am going to Egypt next week. I am giving up my job. I am going to Egypt to study Arabic because I really feel I have to do something about this kind of problem in the world. And I'm going to study Arabic with the mother of my Salia partner. Oh. Five years later. So I, you know, that's one example, but that's pretty profound. And I would just, about these kinds of exchanges, I would just make the analogy with another field I used to work in, which was museums. And in museums, when the advent of online collections came, many of us said, oh, but you can't put the collections online. You have to go see the real thing in the museum. This will ruin museums. But of course, we were wrong because it had the opposite effect. First of all, it was democratic, so everybody could see these great masterpieces. But secondly, it attracted people to museums. And I think that's what virtual exchange does. It doesn't diminish people-to-people -people contact. It increases it because people want to go. Thanks, Cynthia. Did you have anything you wanted to comment on? Or? OK. Um, there's a question right here in the middle. Other hands up there? We're looking. OK. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. My name is Rosemary Seguero. I'm the president of Hope for Tomorrow. We focus on conflict resolution and violence prevention. I'm based in Washington, D.C., though I'm from Kenya. Then looking at your presentation of group and brain, it was very interesting. I'm not a scientist or a, a somebody who understands, but I understood you even if I'm not a scientist. Could you tell me <laughs> something about... Uh, because I'm an African, is there the, that brain? The, is the brain dif, African brain different? Uh, why the brain different? Or what? Looking at all those circles of group people discussion, which makes a difference, and uh, one person cannot make it, two people or a group can make a very big difference. But most of the time, I hear Africans are stupid. Africans don't do this. Africans. Can you explain me if you have researched the brain of an African and a white person or a black person? Thank you. One of the amazing things about getting to see people's brains every day is that you find out that the first thing you see when you see a brain is that everybody's brains look exactly the same. So when I first saw my brain, I was kind of disappointed. It just looked human. <laughs> And the next thing that you realize is that everybody's brains are just as different as their faces. Each brain is a little bit different in shape and size and configuration. And of course, the contents of it are as different as our minds. And so the second thing you feel when you look at the human brain is, wow, each brain is unique. Each brain is so different. And the third thing you think when you see the human brain is that Underneath that, the brains are actually the same again. And it's, it's the third realization, not the first time when they seem the same superficially, but the third one, where you realize the ways in which they're the same even underneath the unique individual differences that I think is part of why neuroscience can be as humanizing as seeing Earth from the moon. OK, we'll take one more right here in the middle. Then I want to hear from some of the other teachers who are here that I know uh, are in some of the other programs. Hi, my name is Mindy Reiser. I'm vice president of an NGO called Global Peace Services, and I used to work for the Fulbright program, people-to-people -people exchange all over the world. 
One of the challenges is the sustainability. Seeds of Peace, as some of the folks in this room know, has really tried to do this, but the challenge is when folks go back home and the intervening political struggles and the family pressures. So it really takes a lot of ongoing support in the countries these people come from for this friendship, for these beginnings to continue. And I wonder what thoughts you have on that. There's been a lot of research on people-to-people -people exchange over the years, and the intervening variables when people get back are really critical. Yeah, absolutely. So actually, when we started this project, the first group we were looking to collaborate with was Seeds of Peace. Um, but they wouldn't have us in Celia Wood. Um, <laughs> But, but we were exactly interested in these kinds of questions and how physical exchange changes the way groups think about one another. And um, Emil Bruno, my colleague who worked on this, knew a lot of people in Seeds of Peace and was particularly interested in uh, an anecdotal observation that many people involved with that program had made, um, which is that there were huge benefits right away, um, but that they disappeared pretty quickly when people went back home. And that in particular, it seemed like maybe even there was a boomerang negative effect. Um, that many people reported having experienced feeling betrayed, that when they got back to their home situations, especially Palestinian participants, when things got bad, the new friends that they had made in the program where everything had seemed so wonderful and easy didn't show up when it was hard and didn't show up where they felt when they felt really embattled and that something was at stake. Um, and certainly one of the things that seems like a potentially very exciting consequence of Exchange 2.0 is that it doesn't start outside of your real life. It starts inside your real life. And so there isn't as much of a danger, hopefully, that you go back to your real life and leave it all behind like summer camp. Because if it was in your real life to begin with, it might be easier to carry it forward in your real life um, afterwards. I think we have a teacher from Iron here who can speak about the experience of your, uh, your Exchange 2.0 experience. We've heard a lot about Celia, but I know there are other programs. Iron is here, Global Nomads Group. Anybody want to take the microphone from either of those groups? Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this uh, today. And yes, I did have uh, some kind of experiences. My students, um, as a Rotary Exchange student programs that I participated on, and now non professional have changed my life. And professionally now, uh, using uh, working with IRN International Education Resource Network, where this cross cultural. Uh, dialogue has helped my students a lot, particularly being from Brasilia, Brazil, and on an underserved um, schools. And the students are looking forward now the World Soccer Cup and also the uh, Olympic Games that are coming up in 2014 and 2016. So they are really trying to implement, uh, increase their language skills. And I think that they are now more motivated in taking, to take action, as you said, some kind of assessment. You know, how I was thinking here, the assessment I could see from my students that I could feel was like they want to take action. They are be becoming more aware of their reality and seeing it uh, worldwide too and having this cross cultural communication. And so, I really hope it does continue a lot and that we have the enforcement of that. Hi, um, my name is Heather O'Brien. I teach ninth grade in Columbia Heights here in DC. And um, due to the recent happenings in Pakistan with Malala, the 14 year old girl who was shot last week, we're gonna be actually working with Iron Pakistan to initiate conversations with some of the ninth graders over there and how they're feeling. and. The biggest impact that it's having, that I predict it's going to have on my students is, you know, this is just a headline that they would have may, maybe not even seen or been able to discuss, have conversations about, but putting faces to names and faces to a country, it's really going to force them to think critically about, you know, how the world is working with their peers in other countries and, and the impact of education on these students. and. I'm really excited to, to have those conversations next week, this week, actually. Thank you. Can you respond to that? Yes. Just to, just to say that um, another line of research that we've been doing in our lab has been looking at loss of empathy between people who feel like they're from competing or conflicting groups. And uh, one of the things that um, we think we're finding is that putting a name on somebody from another group or a face 
A physical face goes a little way to bridging the gap, but actually it makes a huge difference to give that other side a mind. And so the difference between knowing the name or the face of somebody in another culture and knowing about their hopes and plans and aspirations is huge in terms of the impact on, diff on their empathy for the suffering of members of other groups. So exactly what we would predict from, from the data we've had, we've had in our lab is that um, kids who've had a chance to think about kids in Afghanistan or Pakistan, what they want to be when they grow up, or where they want to live, or what they want to study in school next year, just thinking about them as people with plans and hopes um, is exactly what it takes to reduce the difference in the empathy they would feel if it was a kid at home or a kid far away who was um, shot. Yeah, did I see a hand up in that top corner over there? Oh, sorry, right there, beg your pardon. I wonder if your research has been able to inform issues of diversity and inclusion in the American workplace or vice versa? Um, so my own research has not focused on the American workplace, but there is actually an excellent tradition of psychological research specifically on racial diversity in the workforce. Um, so that is, that's work that started in the 60s um, and is, in fact, the one kind of diversity that really um, has been intensively studied uh, in American psychology is um, specifically racial diversity. Um, and as I said, the, the evidence there is that um, diversity in the workplace has a very big impact on attitudes about members of other races. One of the most dramatic experiments, this is ambitious beyond anything I've tried yet, though you never know what Celia will get me to do, um, <laughs> in which uh, the scientists employed um, pairs of people in uh, fake jobs. They were nine-month contracts to do work, and they paid them salaries for nine months. Um, and But it was an experiment, which the participants didn't know they were in, um, because some of them had been hired to work in teams that were mixed race, and some of them had been hired to work in teams that were um, racially homogenous. And after this um, year-long intensive project, um, they then measured attitudes towards the other group um, on lots of actually really uh, realistic measures, like would you be willing to work with them, would you be willing to live near them, would you be willing to hire them, and showed very dramatic benefits of having worked together on attitudes towards um, other races. And this is anecdotally um, similar to what people observed in the military when the military was integrated. Okay, we've got time for one more question over here. I'm sorry, um, we've got to stay on schedule here, and this gentleman's had his hand up for a while. All right, we'll come back maybe. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Derek Cogburn from American University, and uh, the last uh, comment that you just made made me think about Scott Page and his work at the University of Michigan on how diverse groups come up with lots of interesting solutions to problems that homogenous groups tend not to. So if you haven't seen that, it's some really interesting work that might uh, also answer this gentleman's question. Uh, and I'll read And just to say, one of the key things about that, again, is it's not that, say, if you have a mixed group of black and white people, it's not that the black people have different ideas. It's actually that everybody, the black people and the white people, have better ideas in a heterogeneous group than they would have in a homogenous group. Right? It, it, so diversity brings out the best in every member of the group. Exactly. And, and he was talking about the, the, the larger the diversity gives you more dimensions around which you have this kind of difference. But anyway, different question. So uh, I'll read your study, but I'm very interested in the way you're employing these new models to measure uh, concepts within these virtual teams. So could you talk a little bit more about how you you know, specifically, how are you, you know, getting them to sort of pull those uh, circles together and, you know, Absolutely. given that the teams are geographically distributed? Thanks, yeah. It's always the most fun to be asked about your newest experiments. <laughs> um, so, uh, since we haven't even done this yet, this is the best time. Nothing hasn't worked. Um, <laughs> so we have a bunch of projects in mind that are based on models of how cognition is affected by feeling under load. So actually, this has been studied for the last 25 years in lots of other contexts. What are the consequences for your ability to think of basically having to maintain something else in mind. So one thing you might have to maintain is how you and the other group members are behaving. And if that's taking up some part of your mind, right? there's been many answers, but you can think of it even just as dual tasking. Just being put in a context with somebody that you're not sure about is like having a whole second thing to be doing. So there's... 
Um, so the technology is, is independent. So what we have them, the way that these tasks work is at the moment, you sign up online, whether it's through Celia or actually just online through the Turk or however, um, and you're assigned to a group of people. They're all strangers. And you have a task to do together. Um, and the task is designed so that um, verbal communication isn't useful, um, but teamwork is necessary. Um, so one of them is actually just a memory game, right? Each of us gets a turn to click something, turn it over, and click another thing and see if they match. And there's a whole bunch of cards on the board. And what we're trying to do is go as fast as possible to find all of the matches together as a group. Well, the key thing is, if part of my, main, my mind is monitoring, thinking, Wait, that's an Arab, that's an Arab, that's an Arab, I won't be as good at holding in mind the seven 17 different cards that I've already seen to remember where the match is when I now flip one over. And um, the game that I showed you, actually, it's a little more complicated than that. Each of us is trying to make a square, and each of us has a set of triangles. But some of us have the other person's triangle. So what I need to do is notice one of the triangles I have, you need it, and I just need to give it to you, but you can't take it. You, got, you can't ask for it and you can't take it. You have to wait for me to realize I have something you need and give it to you. And that's, again, another task where that requires focusing not only on completing my task, but on figuring out what task all the other members of the group are trying to do and playing my part to make us all finish our job faster together. So the way that the game looks is you sign in. It's an online screen. On the screen are six live video streams that show you the people you're playing with. No sound, just video. Um, and six cursors. And each cursor is labeled with a flag and a name so you know whose cursor is whose. And then you're just looking at the task. And there's nothing explicit. That's part of what I love about this. Nothing that says this is about groups or that it will matter that it's about groups. Um, it's just empirically, if you're worried about the fact that you're playing with an unfamiliar or potentially threatening group, then it's harder for you to do your job. And the idea is, hopefully, becoming a more fluent and familiar and confident um, interactor across cultural boundaries will make you able to do your job, able to collaborate as a team without paying the cost of monitoring across uh, these cultural barriers. Thank you, Rebecca. Shall we? Thank you so much. That was awesome. Awesome. Okay. Listen, I want to close out this session by giving the last word to a professor in Egypt. We've got the Under Secretary of State here. We want to move directly to her remarks. We're very fortunate to have her here. But I think we should have um, Professor Usama Madani, who is at Manufia University which is a public university in uh, about an hour and a half drive north of Cairo, have the last word because we couldn't get him, you know, the time difference made it inconvenient to have him um, stay up for this, but he did send us this video clip and I do think that you'll find it fascinating. Let me say the demographic of students at that university is very representative of the Egyptian population. And in fact, this is the region where both Mohammed Atta, you'll recall from uh, the mastermind of the 9-11 attacks, and Hosni Mubarak grew up in this region. So if you can roll that video, and then it's a uh, short, short video. For 10 years, I have been doing several activities to expose students to the outside world. And in each of these attempts, I have found that it, in each time I do this, it takes a day, it takes two days, and then the event is completed. By one week, these students regress again to their normal state of minds. This continued until three years ago, when by chance, by sheer chance, we got in touch with Sulia's Connect program. I introduced it to my students, and at once they were enthusiastic because this is an opportunity for them. I had a couple of junior staff members to help me do this and we organized the first semester. They started like the first two weeks in exactly the same way as the events in which I organized, the attack. And if they are attacked, they become the close the shell around themselves, they protect themselves. Gradually these students, with the third, with the fourth week, and because it's, it is a sustained um, program, one session a week, 
each every week, gradually I began to sense something changing within these students. At first they came to me and they said, we have a couple of students who are not good students. They are bad. They keep saying things. They keep saying things which are, which are against Islam, which is against the Arab world. But then later on, they began to learn. And then two weeks later, they began telling me that we have students who are of a Jewish background. What a disaster. Can you imagine this? A Jew, me talking to a Jew? He's, 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 he's going to probably now call Israel so that they can attack us. This is how, this is how sometimes they, they, they function, how, how, how their mindset is set. By the middle of the program, I, I found them talking about these Jews actually sharing their common belief telling them that the Palestinians need a state just as desperately as Israel does, and that to guarantee the safety of Israel, we need a state for Palestine to exist. Now, these ideas did not exist in our students' minds. They only, be, they only have one, you know, they think in black and white when it comes to this. It's either Israel or Palestine. Now, when you find someone else, especially Jewish, telling them that we need both an Israel and the Palestine, this makes them reevaluate their entire mindsets. By the end of the first semester, we've conducted six now, these students' mindsets, their whole personality is completely changed. Completely changed. They said, by the, when we started, we thought that this was, an, this was an, a deception. We were deceived into talking to students who are actually playing a game with us. But gradually, we found that these students are flesh and blood, that these students have their own fears, have their own preconceptions about us. They thought that we were there lurking in the dark to attack them. They discovered that the fear does not only exist in them, it exists also with the other. And this is what made them revise their entire, their entire personalities. And you should see the impact of this on the other students who are a majority and who are still stereotyping the other, immersed in preconceptions about the other. You should see the, the, the form of dialogue now between the minority and this majority. And they would talk both inside the classroom and outside the classroom. They would talk to other professors. And these students would come back to me and say, why have the entire 14 students changed? It's not one or two. Something is wrong here. But then they began to ask, can we join? We want to prove to you that this is an entire game, that these students are deceived. The next session, 14 students take part and they themselves go through the process and they, they begin to acknowledge the other, to see the other. And because of this, I'm, I, I don't know if I, tell, if I should say this or not, but I have been conducting the Solea Connect program secretly at my university because I have been overwhelmed by students who want to take part in it. I have a, a waiting list of 700 students and I cannot go public, because if I go public, I will find thousand students storming my office. So I keep it secret. I tell them, don't tell anyone. So they tell their nearest student, their friends, and it is their friends that come and, and put their names on the waiting list, and it's 700 now, and I don't know what to do with them. This is an, an excellent opportunity for them to see the other, to know the other, but most importantly, to know themselves and to acknowledge their own fears and their own preconceptions. And as I, I, I always say, they, they, the participants themselves have told me that, do you know what? And at the end, there are no bridges that need to be built between us and these other students and the other and the West. The bridges are there. But these types of programs 
makes us walk and meet somewhere in the middle. This program has provided a middle ground for us to connect and talk to each other. We don't need to build a bridge. He is, after all, like me. So it's, um, it has been an, an excellent opportunity, uh, which I hope we can uh, maintain and support in the future. Thank you, Professor Madani, in your own words, quite powerful testimony. All right, now it is such a personal pleasure for me to be introducing our next speaker, someone who really needs no introduction in this building, from whence she cometh, uh, before being sworn in last April as the Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs. Tara worked tirelessly for many years to help USIP become more effective in our peace-building work around the world, just as she is now working tirelessly to help this Department of State and the nation become more effective in its public diplomacy work. So ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor for me to invite to the podium someone who inspires anyone who has had the pleasure to work with her under Secretary of State, Tara Sunshine. Wow, what an honor to be in this building. It's sort of like coming home to your grade school after you've graduated, um, but it looks big. I want to acknowledge some wonderful people here today, um, friends and colleagues, George Moose, I saw someplace, Sheldon, thank you, Queen Noor, Tony Verstandig, Cynthia Schneider, so many colleagues and friends. Before I deliver the remarks, I was so moved. How many of you were so moved by Rebecca's research? Um, I was. I found myself so delighted that my brain was not up there because it would would look all overstuffed and chaotic. Um, But I also found myself reflecting on a certain word that came up in her research. It's this word, listening. What a powerful word. And I'll tell you one quick story about listening. But you have to listen really carefully. I went to work for Ted Koppel and ABC News Nightline in the 1980s. And it was a show that put people of, let's say, divergent views on the same program. And so it required a lot of listening, which in television is not a natural suit. But I remember my very first night booking guests for Nightline, and I was eager to please, and I wrote up my biographies for the anchorman of the guests, and I suggested some questions that Mr. Koppel should ask. I will never forget. He looked, and he read it, and he tossed the document aside. I was horrified. And he said, how do you know what questions I'm going to ask if I haven't heard the answers the guests are going to give? Think about it. What he was saying is we don't always know where a conversation is going to go. And if we have a preconceived agenda, a fundamental notion of where this conversation is going to go, we might miss the chance to be off track. So with that, let me get my specs and go on track. Um, I know very well, because I was sitting in the front row back in April of 2011 when my predecessor, Judith McHale, stood in this very spot and talked about this very issue. That made me a little nervous when the invitation came. Because as Under Secretary McHale said back then, working through government to government channels is no longer enough. If we want our people to people exchanges to remain central to the public diplomacy engagement, we have to open new lines. We have to communicate government to people and people to more people. 
And one of the best ways she correctly said was to leverage conversations through social media and connective technologies. So I didn't want to come here and not give you a good progress report on what's been done. But let me first say, and some will agree with me, some may not, that I do not think virtual and physical is a zero-sum game. I do not think we are really talking about fully replacing traditional face-to-face -face interactions and exchanges with only digital relationships. Because no matter how evolved our technology becomes, there is no substitute fully and always and everywhere for that student sitting across the table with somebody else from another country. And I would encourage that we also look at the research about physical contact, what it means for someone to get a handshake, a hug, or just a shared meal. Nor are we suggesting that every student in the world can avail themselves of online connectivity and virtual exchange. But there is room where we can for both, virtual and physical, leveraging one another in powerful ways. Exchange 2.0 is combining the cutting edge new with the traditional, increasing the bandwidth of diplomacy and what I call a win-win 2.0. The truth is we really can't afford not to do both because more and more people converse, operate, trade, invest, interact, and do groundbreaking activity online. And social media is often the central tool. So yes, teleconferencing, Skype conversations between friends, associates, entrepreneurs should become commonplace. And we do have to try to make the accessibility commonplace. Right now, as we sit here with our mobile devices, and thank you for not using them this moment, but there are six billion mobile devices in circulation. So if we don't get in the arena, we, the State Department and others, we would simply become irrelevant. More importantly, we would lose the chance to help citizens become relevant and empowered and enlivened and uplifted and support their most positive, most productive, and yes, most peaceful aspirations. So by harnessing social media, we will deepen the impact and quality of our public diplomacy, and we can reach people who need it most. And I'm talking about those who are hampered by geographic challenge and political constraint. There are people out there yearning for interaction. There is no way we can have direct contact and in-person experiences with even a small fraction. Virtual technology will give us the capacity to significantly scale up engagement opportunities. And we will help more people write and text their own futures, whether they are learning English, strengthening social media capabilities, participating in an exchange program, or just simply the three C's, connectivity, communications, and confidence. Exchange 2.0 works as an extension of ongoing public diplomacy because it maintains the relationship before and after. The more we engage, the more productive, the more the environment is created, that enabling environment for interaction, investment, and trade, which ultimately means enhanced national security. So what have we really been doing all this time? Well, if you look back, and I have, for more than 10 years, the Global Connections and Exchange Program supported and has continued to support online linkages with students, 
educators, and youth leaders. So I asked for some of the data. This is an audience loves data. Since 2004, if you just looked at teachers, 6,000 teachers in more than 100 countries have benefited from one program, the Teacher Scholarship E program. That's innovative online graduate level teaching courses. Most recently, we organized virtual exchanges on the margins of high profile events. So what we did was organize online virtual engagement running alongside physical engagement. Examples, the World Summit of Nobel Laureates in Chicago. At that event, State was connecting students at Chicago's Linking Park High School with young people in Algeria, Ghana, Peru, Zimbabwe. And out in the field, if you talk to posts, our embassies are leveraging technologies widely, bringing diverse groups together in a virtual space. In the caucuses, I was shown one post with training and support from our own International Information Bureau, bringing students together from Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. And they were discussing the American experience in democracy. That's outreach. And what it does in a region with a history of armed conflict and cultural mistrust is create some understanding and some space for listening. But we have to do much more. So I'm pleased to announce today that we are standing up a new virtual exchange team at the State Department. And I'm delighted that Victoria Esser is here from the State Department, who's one of our czars and gurus of virtual exchanges. But we will have a virtual exchange unit that will integrate all of the virtual aspects into all of our ECA programs. And the goal is simply expansion, expansion of reach and capability. The second goal of the initiative is to open some new channels between young people in the United States and youth around the world. Without the technology, we know we can't have all the conversations and build all the networks. Another idea we have, which is coming to fruition next month, is to host a virtual college fair over 24 hours. It will be the world's largest educational platform where 200 colleges and universities can present their materials online instead of those little booths that we all remember from our high school years. And the notion there is let's get a good diversity of schools, because we all know there are schools out there with fewer resources that can leverage their international recruitment if given a level playing field, and increase the availability of information about studying in the United States. So why can't international students know every kind of college and university here and come to one 24-hour cycle fair, respective of their time zone and their region, and increase the engagement between educational advisors and students who go to all of our American spaces. Another relatively new innovation are the youth tech camps, empowering people with the skills of digital networks. This is an extension of what Secretary Clinton means by 21st century statecraft, engaging with the alumni of our engagement programs. So, so far we've done three youth tech camps. One of the partners, Iron, is here, and thank you for the help in administering the youth tech camp in Bangladesh, the youth tech camp in Pakistan. Both were hugely successful. And over the three initial youth tech camps, where you've connected alumni of all of the YES programs, the Kennedy Luger study programs. Because once someone finishes a program, they're not finished with the virtual community. 
I also do want to begin to close with some thoughts about you who are here in the audience. Critical to the success and impact of State Department-sponsored virtual exchanges must be partnerships with individuals and entities in the public, private, and nonprofit space. People like you, who bring the array of talent and assets and resources to the interconnected challenges we face. I think later today you'll be hearing from Lucas Welch, whose CELIA organization has partnered with IRON and Global Nomads Group and helped form what we now consider the Exchange 2.0 Coalition. And with programs like Connect, they are working to make virtual exchange a robust force for the 21st century. One more new initiative I wanted to tell you about is GIST, Global Innovation Through Science and Technology. We have got to get a handle on the STEM issues facing not only the US, but the global community. So we are working with CRDF Global, a public-private nonprofit that promotes technology-based entrepreneurship around the globe. We are working with the U.S. Embassy in Islamabad and the MIT Enterprise Forum in Pakistan. And we created a video conference that connected 500 Pakistani entrepreneurs with mentors and business members around their country. If it weren't for these partners and that technology, we could never convene such a widely dispersed community. So these are just a few models that we are employing. We are imagining a future and a reality that is here already, with the rewards obvious, helping people, particularly young people, address their needs, meet their challenges, meet their God-given potential, and emerge as productive citizens. That is the outcome we can all applaud. So on behalf of my colleagues at State, we look forward to connecting with you, collaborating with you, scaling up, and widening out the impact of virtual exchange. I know we can, I know we must, and I know we will make a difference. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I'm excited. I'm really excited, especially hearing about this new team being stood up within the State Department under Victoria's uh, leadership. That's really exciting. Um, so, thank you, Madam Undersecretary. Um, we have, she's got to leave for another engagement, but we're very fortunate that we have got Deputy Assistant Secretary Adam Arelli from her team, the public diplomacy team of the State Department, who will be on this next panel. So questions that you might have had for Tara, feel free to direct towards Adam, who is, I should say, standing in for Assistant Secretary Stock, who wasn't feeling very well. So uh, nevertheless, again, a sort of a sign of the department's um, commitment to this issue that we have have just such a, a strong presence here today. We are on to our final session of the meeting. Um, the, I should also remind you all, there is an evening reception to reward you with after uh, being so patient for the three hours. But first, we've got an absolutely critical discussion here on the heels of everything that we have been talking about, hearing about impact, about resources, about moving forward. And to take us through that um, very important discussion, we are fortunate to have as our moderator, Tony Ristandig, Chair of the Aspen Institute's Middle East Programs, Senior Vice President at the uh, S. Daniel Abraham Center for Middle East Peace, and former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Near Eastern Affairs at the State Department from 1994 to 2001. Perhaps most pertinent for today's meeting is her current role at Aspen, where she oversees the Secretariat for the recently launched Partners for New Beginning, 
which is a public-private partnership that deepens engagement between the U.S. and local communities on issues of economic opportunity, science and technology, education, and international exchange in 10 countries from North Africa to Indonesia. It is a real pleasure to welcome Tony back to USIP. Call up the panel. Um, uh, do you, or would you like what, me? Do you, have, yeah, why do don't we? Them one yes, time? sure. I'd like to um, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And if I could um, introduce um, each of our panelists. Um, and first of all, I'd like to ask Adam Airely to come up, my colleague uh, and friend. Adam, it's nice to have you. Um, Adam and I worked together at the State Department when we were mere children. Uh, <laughs> and Adam, as you know, is Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, for the Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs. Adam and I served together um, in the Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs. And once you're in NEA, you are all always in NEA. So it is a privilege to have you um, uh, on this panel. Um, Jackie Bezos, if you could please join us. Jackie um, is um, a wonderful uh, colleague. I was privileged to meet Jackie this past summer at the Aspen Institute Ideas Festival. Jackie is co-director of the Bezos Family Foundation. And one of the things in reading Jackie's um, bio that really struck me and, and is very much uh, my sweet spot. Jackie's bio speaks to the issue. Not only is she um, co-directs the Bezos Family Foundation, which is one of the first private foundations to invest in virtual exchange programming, but Jackie's bio speaks to the issue that she loves big ideas and passion, uh, which is the sweet spot of philanthropy. And that hardly reflects her passion for education, for driving philanthropy and all that you do. And it's an honor to have you here. Uh, your um, participation at the Aspen Ideas Festival on a program on women in philanthropy was extraordinary this past summer. So thank you for joining us. Uh, Maggie Mitchell-Salem. Maggie and I also served um, at the State Department. And we continue to work in the and toil in the fields of the Middle East. Um, Maggie is executive director of the Cutter Foundation and, as everyone knows, has been a pioneer uh, in promoting education and facilitating interaction in uh, cross-cultural exchange and has been extraordinarily supportive in the issue of cross-cultural dialogue and especially this sweet spot of virtual exchange. Uh, Maggie has... I don't think your bio can hardly reflect all that you've done in the many uh, areas of um, cross-cultural exchange, education, governance um, in the region. So we're very um, privileged to have you here. Andrew Cedar is um, a colleague also, um, and uh, we work very closely together on our Partners for New Beginning and Public-Private Partnership. Andrew serves currently as head of global engagement um, at the National Security Council in the White House. And for Andrew to take the time to be with us today uh, speaks volumes about the commitment this administration makes to the issue of cross-cultural dialogue and virtual exchange to have both um, Tara Sonnenshine, Adam Airely, and um, Andrew uh, really, um, I think, represents an enormous commitment of this administration to this issue. So, um, Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. And Lucas, um, as we have heard from so many, uh, Lucas uh, Welch is the founder and chief innovation officer of Solia and is participating here today as both a representative of Solia and the Exchange 2.0 Coalition. Uh, together with, if I could also um, reflect our iEARN colleagues who are here today and global nomads, listening um, to um, others speak to the Exchange 2.0 Coalition, really um, framed uh, earlier by all accounts, um, a call to action. Everyone who has been um, working on this issue, uh, both Queen Noor, I want to thank you for helping frame for us earlier today uh, in your remarks, because you said so well um, the importance of exchange and dialogue. But 
um, you have been um, a soldier in the field um, for in so many ways for all of us in terms of understanding the the extraordinary importance of people-to-people -people exchange and um, how we need to remain and step up our engagement. And I, we owe you a deep debt of gratitude for remaining engaged with us as we try to uh, work through these complicated and difficult issues. Um, but I remain ever hopeful that we have people like yourself um, that will continue to help us chart a path of understanding um, between Americans and the Muslim world. So we thank you very much from the bottom of our heart. So we have a lot to discuss today. And rather than giving you a representation of um, all that, that I have um, to bring to the table, I think it's time for us to go right to the, the roadmap, the call to action. Tara, Queen Noor, uh, and others um, have brought uh, a lot to the table. And I think we have heard, uh, and Rebecca, you gave us um, the science behind um, the, the uh, importance of virtual exchange. But I want us to, if we could, and Adam, I'm going to ask you right off the bat. So we recognize the importance of exchange. We know, um, and you now have set up this new unit um, uh, for virtual exchange. But what I would like to know is let's talk about roles and responsibilities of all the stakeholders. And if each of you could, um, if, we, if I could hear from you, and if we could start with the US government role from Adam to the White House, and Jackie from philanthropy, and also Maggie, and then our uh, Lucas. How do we identify roles and responsibilities of stakeholders? What is our call to action? So it's not just government to government exchange. It is not just private sector to private sector. It truly is public-private partnerships that is the call to action and the new roadmap. And how do we leverage to get to the complementarity of virtual with the traditional exchange so that we can enhance our outreach. So Adam, could you kick us off, please? Sure. I think, is this on? OK. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, we need to start with a, uh, an assessment of uh, strength and weaknesses of the indi individual actors in this. In other words, the, the, iron, the irons, the global nomads, the Salias, what do they bring to the table? What does the government bring to the table? How do you marry what you do best with what we do best? Um, and we, we, we began this conversation last year in this forum. Uh, and I'm pleased to see a lot of the people who are at that conversation are here today. Um, the good news is, I think, you know, we, you talk about call to action. I mean, we're, in the, we're well into the second year of this kind of uh, this effort. And I'm really, I think there's some instructive lessons we've learned from that first year. Um, uh, that we should we should accelerate and and build on. Um, we've we have worked, for example, in Tunisia uh, with Global Nomads to connect Americans and Tunisians in a moment of uh, great drama and great misunderstanding. Um, we have worked uh, again with Iron in Pakistan and Bangladesh to empower youth. And the lesson le learned that I take away from that is twofold. Number one. Uh, I see government as a catalyst. I don't see government as, um, how should I put it, the chorus master of this. Uh, because, you know, we need to remember government's uh, resources and capabilities, notwithstanding this virtual exchange team with unit, which is pretty modest, I mean, government's capabilities and resources are limited, particularly with respect to the demand that's out there. Uh, I mean, what the guy from uh, everything the professor from Menufia said multiply by a thousand. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's got, you know, Menufia is not even the biggest university in Egypt. They've got, let's say, 25 big universities in Egypt. They've got, well, what about China? What about India? The same need that he expressed in that video is everywhere. So there's no, there's, there's no budget in the world that can meet that, that could demand. meet that demand. Uh, and there's no single organization, whether it be governmental or non-governmental, that can meet that demand. So governments are a catalyst. Andrew, do you agree? 
Governments uh, are a catalyst. I think that's, that's definitely right uh, for a few reasons. First of all, um, part of what we can do is reshape the debate on this. And I think it has often been in the context of cultural exchange as a good in itself. And the reality is the more the world changes, the more we recognize uh, that not just virtual exchange, but sort of collaboration across borders is not something that's just a nice to have. It's a must have at this point. And so by reframing that, we bring in a broader uh, cross section of stakeholders who probably don't necessarily find themselves attracted to getting into this space. I think when you look beyond that, you recognize a couple of things. Um, one is that, as Adam said, our resources are finite. And anyone who's paying attention to the political debate in this country knows that there's probably uh, that, that sort of flatness of resources goes out pretty far. Uh, and at the same time, the set of stakeholders who now can play and need to play in this space is ballooning all the time. And so we need to serve that role as a catalyst. And what we can do is make sure that our investments are in the places that are most strategic to help grow that, but also that we look to a set of partners. And I think our partners are also under an increasing amount of stress because uh, this, you know, we've framed this as a public-private sort of partnership. We need to start moving towards a public-public partnership. We need both the public sector, but the general public. We, you know, the, the number of stakeholders who need to be involved is greater than any given uh, entity in this room, frankly, to, to sort of pull those folks in. And so I think our, our challenge is both as a catalyst in terms of setting the terms of the debate, but also directing this sort of set of, uh, of assets that we have towards many different ends. I think cultural exchange is certainly one of them, but when you start to bring these people together, there are all kinds of tangible ends, whether it's in uh, research, whether it's in how we respond to disasters, whether it's in a whole host of things where the sort of diffused processing power of millions of people that had sort of until now been very, very much sort of locked in uh, local settings is now able to connect and collaborate. Uh, and, and it's on us, I think, to not just restrict this to the space in which we're exchanging cultural views, but also help ch channel that energy. Because I think a lot of the young people around the world who want to connect with each other want to do it because it's interesting to talk to each other, but they also recognize more than probably any generation until now that there's a set of shared challenges that they need to work on together, that it's not just about getting to know each other, uh, but it's about a set of things where they'd like to make an impact on the world. And what these platforms can help us to do is not just get them to know each other, but channel their talents and their energies towards really productive ends that help all of us in a strategic sense, but also uh, locally for governments and communities there. So given the limited resources we have, I think what we can help do is both set the terms of that debate, but then also channel those energies towards the most productive outcomes. Jackie is a um, philanthropist who stepped up to the plate um, uh, early on in this process. What appealed to you about um, the virtual exchange space? And how did you see that space, given your interest um, and being such an important player in the education space? Well, it, uh, after 2000 and after 9-11, 2001, um, it was clear that there was an opportunity for dialogue and a need for quick dialogue. And we turned to Global Nomads Group to facilitate that. And they paired up. Um, I think it was Tulsa, no, Oklahoma City, and the children from New York City, and Jordan, and the Philippines. Am I missing one? Yeah. And that was an amazing dialogue. Mm -hmm. Amazing dialogue that had never taken place before, and it's taken place so many times since then. We spent a lot of time in this country talking about the education gap. I mean, everybody reads about it every day, and certainly it is worthy of all of our conversations. But we also have something that is possibly just as critical, if not more critical, and that's the culture gap. So being able to provide um, opportunities for young people to speak to one another, to work on common issues together, uh, to come up with, be co-creators of solutions, is only going to make this world stronger. Very, very well said. Maggie, um, you well, too are on this space, in this space. Yes, we are. Uh, Cutter Foundation International realized early on, uh, both because I'm a product of a Fulbright grant, but also because, despite what people think about the resources of the state of Qatar, um, they are as limited as everyone else's. And it does take a global community coming together um, to often achieve what we need to do. And so Qatar is part of this. And Her Highness Sheikha Moza, 
um, under her guidance, and in fact she was just in a schoolroom in Harlem a few weeks ago um, watching kindergarten kids say their first words of Arabic in a program we're supporting uh, through a partner there, the Global Language Program, and in coordination with the Department of Education in New York. And she was approached by the head of the Global Language Project and asked, how can we take these small children and connect them to kids in Qatar? Now, I know we've been focusing on college-age kids, and we've been talking about high school-age kids, but kids are kids. And the younger you get them, the more open their minds are. They haven't fixed an idea of this you know, other kindergarten kid halfway across the world. They don't even know where halfway across the world is. And you know, we are now thinking about K to five and what that looks like. And what I'd say to add to this dialogue, because you're absolutely right, it, I think we're all speaking to different pieces of this. It is really going to take a consortium. It's going to take individuals like Queen Noor who have been working on this for a very long time. And it's going to take my boss, and it's going to take all of our respective bosses saying, we're going to commit you know, blood, sweat, and tears to this and some cash too. And those of us who have different levels of resources will contribute to them. I understand there might be some representatives here from the European Union. This is not a conversation just for us at the US Institute of Peace. This is a global dialogue. There are countries that each in their own way can contribute. And I think if we allow this to really be a consortium where it's not the US government directing, it's not anyone else just receiving, it's all of us, you know, what did we say? We listen, we speak, you know, there's that dialogue aspect to this which often um, unfortunately gets lost at governmental levels and maybe some of us in the private sector can help remind everyone about civilized conversation and that it's not always about politics and in fact it's better when it's not. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would just say that if we look at this from K to 12, if we have a concrete plan, and for us at QFI, it's never about imposing. We approach our partner schools, each of them individually in very different ways. We approach our communities differently. Starting an Arabic program in New York looks very different from starting an Arabic program in Houston. And so you approach the communities and ask them, what do you need? What do you want? What are you interested in? And what teachers want, and, and I'm sorry to be speaking on behalf of many talented teachers here, but they want ease of use. Make it user friendly. Can we drop it in? Can we use it in the classroom like Iron builds tools that you just plug and play? How do you develop curriculum that a teacher says, I have this subject. It doesn't seem to have any sort of cross-cultural component to it, like climate change that we're working with GNG on. It does. A kid sitting in Chicago communicating with a kid in Qatar about very different but very real shared water challenges, that goes to Dr. Sachs's point. Give them something to work on. It's not about hummus and a soda. There are problems, and kids want to solve them. And they can do that in different ways at different ages and different stages, and we can all help them. But what really actually devastates me, and, and then I'll be quiet, is that we're having this wonderful conversation, but there are things that we can all do. And so, um, because I'm brash, and people who ask me on this panel know that, we're announcing that we're supporting um, the work that Solia is doing with MIT. And so QFI will be supporting that research going forward. Um, that's a decision we made very recently. And I'm delighted that we're going to be able to do that. And also, we're going to be trading, training young cuttery college students who have come out of our two online platforms, um, C2C, Classroom to Classroom, and Yalla, which was actually started by a young Qatari and a young uh, high school student from Chicago. And the, high, the college age students who have graduated up into Yalla um, are going to be hopefully facilitators. Maggie, so that's really, spectacular. Really looking forward to that. Anyway, I just wanted to say sometimes it just takes a little bit of doing, and it this isn't big. This is not big money. I can say that very clearly, but it's it's about being there and saying you're willing to step into the void. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think um, congratulations, and I, I think that's spectacular. Let me speak to the issue of both listening and um, a concept that is embedded in the public and public-private partnership that is an outgrowth of President Obama's Cairo speech, um, which is Partners for New Beginning, which um, was referred to in, in my introduction. And it, we are very much about locally owned and locally driven. And we have to, you have to listen to your local partners, whether they are in Chicago or Cairo or uh, in Rabat uh, or Tunis. And sometimes um, it, you may not always hear what you think you're going to hear, and you have to make adjustments. One of the things that I uh, am impressed upon with the concept of technology, let's remember, um, many of us have an iPhone. And when you travel overseas, the whole concept of um, the good of America is intersected with that iPhone. It is innovation and creativity. It is the Steve Jobs biography. But it is also about STEM research. It is science, technology, engineering, and math. And it is our great strength, and I believe to my core that those come together in this virtual space that uh, complements our traditional Fulbright scholarship. So Lucas, can you, um, I'd like to uh, hear your thoughts on some of the, the themes and threads that we have been discussing um, both on this panel and previously, and how um, Solia has um, uh, picks up on that. And I think I was mentioning to you before I came today, I listened to uh, Hala Garani's piece she did on CNN, and I, it was, you know, fantastic to see the Georgetown t students with you and the Connect and Global Nomads uh, and, and the students. It's, and, this, and Solia, you keep replicating that and replicating it, um, but I also think you're absolutely right. And Jackie, I know you're also in the K through 12 space. Uh, we have to grab kids younger to influence their thinking. But Lucas, over to you. Yeah, no, I, I think the first thing to say, Tony, is that I think, I hope I speak on all of us who are part of the Exchange 2.0 coalition. I think we're very optimistic about what the future holds. I think particularly with this notion of a public-private partnership, whether it's IRON, Global Nomads Group, or our organization, Solia, we, we've each been pretty extraordinary collaborative efforts to date. Um, I think both in terms of you know, we've been doing this work now for, for 10 years. This is a pretty mature model at this point, but in many ways, we're really the new kids on the block here. I think it's important to point out that Ed Greger and the work they do at IRON, they've been doing this work now for 25 years. Mm -hmm. um, and Chris Plute and all of his colleagues at Global Nomads Group are doing the work for 15 years. So we, we've really come a long way now. And I, I think it's actually quite rare to have a number of organizations coming together who, frankly, if you look at it through a certain lens, are competitors. We're competing for finite dollars in terms of fundraising. But we've agreed to work together to share best practices, to develop measurement instruments, to hold ourselves accountable. And so I think that's just one illustration of, of one mode of cooperation. The other obvious one, of course, is the support that, that Maggie just highlighted, specifically from the Qatar Foundation International, which we're thrilled about. Thank you. Um, but also from a range of different supporters, whether it's foundations that have been in the region, uh, like the Al-Walid Foundation, um, obviously the work in, and that you've done at the Bezos Family Foundation is extraordinary in terms of helping Global Nomads Group thrive, but also um, from government. And, and I think based on our proximity to the State Department, it's worth pointing out that each of our organizations has received significant support from the State Department that have really helped us grow our programs. I think it's also worth talking about the other dimensions to a public-private partnership. And it's not, of course, just about money. It's about bringing exposure to our work. It's about finding key partners to advance that work. And over the years, in addition to getting financial support, I think it's, it's, it's worth noting that that gentleman who you heard speak so thoughtfully from Minofia University, Professor Madani, he's a Fulbrighter. And time and again, we find that we're able to build off the decades of work that the State Department has already done building these bridges and find allies like that that have proved crucial to us getting inroads into these new universities. And people who go through those experiences are now looking, how can we apply how can we apply the new tools to provide our students with a similar type of experience? And so 
I, I think there's a lot of indicators to point towards a, a strong and robust future to a public-private partnership. One of the ones that I'm perhaps most excited about is my colleague Shamal Idris, when he was just in uh, Cairo, Egypt, met with the information resource officer in Egypt at the American embassy there, who has now established a, the first, to our knowledge, virtual exchange scholarships for Egyptian students to be funded to participate in virtual exchange. Now, mm. anyone who saw that, that video, I, I, it got a little bit of a laugh line when he mentioned that there are 700 students, he's doing it in secret. But I, I think it's worth us pointing out that scale matters. It really does matter that there are, as you said, Adam, that there, multiply that thousands over. And there are mechanisms we have now to reach those people, as Rebecca spoke to, that can really make a difference and can cost us a fraction of the cost. So I want to inject a sense of urgency into this. And, and I also want to encourage us to be a bit more rigorous in how we define virtual exchange. I think it's tempting to think of anything that involves education and involves new technology as virtual exchange. But there's a lot that can happen in the online space that does not necessarily deepen your interaction with another group. And so for us at the Exchange 2.0 Coalition, we talk about virtual exchange as being people-to-people, -people, sustained, curriculum-based, and technology-based interaction. And I think that it's important that we focus because technology is just a tool. You can do a lot with this tool. But I, I really I, I find Adam's initial remarks in terms of you know, understanding what are the things that each of us can do well and, and what should we be doing. And frankly, I think it would be a, a healthy dynamic for each of us to talk about what do we think we should be doing. I want to go back to that. Let's go back to the roles and responsibility piece. And I, I think Lucas said it, uh, touched on it uh, quite well. Um, and going back to one of the things that I think government um, it, you can do more effectively, yes, you can catalyze, you can be a catalyst, but you also need to create more clarity because sometimes... You can, yeah, forget it. <laughs> the one who was, I can now say that having been. Uh, it's, you know, to kind of stay the course um, and say we're investing, this is it. It's not, especially from the private sector, both whether it's, if I may speak to the issue of philanthropy or, pri or nonprofits or um, the, the private sector uh, corporations, it, it can't be just the new idea. We have to sort of this, it, we're in, we're going to stay the course and you, you can provide that good housekeeping seal of approval. And, you know, so let's go back to the roles and responsibility piece, both yeah from all of our participants. Well, let's, let's flesh out the idea of what a catalyst means. Um, and, and what, and look, this is a discussion. I, I don't really, I haven't thought this through in great details. And, and people, will have, a lot of, for, people for will have a lot of ideas. But it seems to me that, it seems to me that, uh, look, virtual, uh, virtual exchanges have established, uh, established their legitimacy have established their permanency. Uh, they are a function of the people-to-people, uh, -people, the, the world of people-to-people -people exchanges. So now the question before us is, OK, having, having established the bona fides, having intellectually accepted the kind of permanence of, the, of these technologies, uh, how, do we, um, how, how do we express uh, or and embody uh, a broader vision. Uh, it seems to me we're a little bit too, not stovepipe, but narrow. In other words, you know, iron has its niche. Global Nomads has its niche. You have your niche. You're running after different um, pots of funding. I mean, the, the grants from ECA, grants from uh, Undersecretary this, uh, uh, projects with the Cutter Foundation, Bezos, whatever. So it seems to me the next stage that would be in the evolution of this would be what I would call an agenda setting, uh, an agenda setting um, process, uh, whereby we all get together and say, what's the vision? Let's think big. Let's think the world. Let's think the different, let's break down the different aspects of 
people-to-people uh, -people exchanges we do. And then rather than each of us running after different sources of funding, we, we, present, uh, we present to the uh, philanthropic and governmental community, because again, it's not just the United States, it's the EU and all those guys, uh, we present as, as virtual exchange, as a virtual exchange coalition. Let's not call it exchange 2.0, because I don't know what 2.0 means, and you have to be a <laughs> geek to know what it means. So let's just call it the virtual exchange coalition. And, uh, and, 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 and what is our vision for the next 10 years? And that way you get off from the, like, you know, the flavor of the month or the flavor of the, the quadrennial or the flavor of the administration. And you get into a, you get, you get a real thing there and you, you, you bring in, and that's a true public-private par partnership because not only is it a pu partnership between the public, i.e. government, and the private NGOs, but it would bring private funders together. And it just seems like it's more efficient. It, it, it is also higher and more impactful because you're not just pooling resources, but, but having a coordinated set of ideas. Yeah. And that doesn't mean everybody has to be doing the same thing, but it's like, OK, here we are, and here you are. And, and, and you, you sum it all up with a global effect. What is the global effect? And again, that's kind of you know, we're, from where, where, where we sit in ECA and, uh, and the State Department is, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for a global impact. And what we've got now is like lots of really neat pinpricks that you can feel. And it's like make y'all tingly, but let's uh, <laughs> let's have a whole whole of body experience. Wow, that sounds scary. Whoa, Adam, that's <laughs> intense. That's very intense. <laughs> okay, I'm liking this. I'm go. liking this. Bring him over to Peace Institute. And yeah, well, yeah, Andrew. So what I hear from this concept is that. So I'm not respectfully. While I'm interested in the global. Obviously, I'm very focused on uh, the Middle East region, more, you know, sort of the broader uh, MENA region going into the Muslim world. So we'll take it all the way to South Asia. Um, but I think what I hear is a, a you know, sort of revisiting um, this new public private partnership and sort of doing a stock taking. Okay, where are we? Um, do we have it right? The region, remember, this started before the revolutions before the, the region has dramatically begun its change. And it's, it's interesting to look at a stock taking. So um, what's your reaction, Andrew, from where you sit? It's hard to follow up the Adam Early tour de force there, but. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you can do it. Come on. So I think there are a couple of things. One is, if you just want to take the Middle East for a moment, obviously there's a lot of discontinuity over the last number of years. But there's actually a lot of continuity in terms of where our priorities have Very been when so. it comes to a number of the types of programs we're talking about, and not just virtually, but building these sorts of connections between people. And, and one of the great things, I think, coming out of the transitions in the region is how much we see these new governments now coming to us, probably more than their predecessors, prioritizing these issues. Exactly. And so we're not just getting it from the exchange community, but we're getting it from the top of the policy communities as well the need to elevate these issues because uh, we have an interest as much as new governments do in trying to find positive channels for the energies and talents of their young people. Uh, and everybody recognizes uh, on both sides of that that being able to tap those energies is a critical part for both of us in moving forward. So the question of reassessment and how we sort of get to where we are now um, I think is one that pervades this space but goes far beyond, which is how in a world where seemingly, I mean, we, we've seen only over the last couple of months how little control uh, governments and even major institutions can have. What does it even mean to take uh, stock of what the agenda is? And how, how do we sort of set the parameters and help build up some of the pillars uh, and recognizing that a lot of this needs to happen in a space that we can't control? And so uh, I think one of the challenges that, that we look to, uh, the non-governmental space to help us figure out is how do we actually tap into this? And I think Adam and I would both fully agree we're not great at doing that. We are institutions that were set up over a very long period of time on the foreign policy space uh, to be insular, to be focused on government to government relations. 
And I, we're not the only ones struggling with this. Every corporation in the world is struggling with this. Every NGO is struggling with it. But how do you take this sort of diffusion of power that has happened through information networks that has now happened all across the world, particularly uh, in the Middle East, and how do we actually help tap that? And I think we tend to think about this in very small ways. And even when we talk about public-private partnerships, it tends to be, can you cut a check to us or can we cut a check to you? Uh, and that doesn't actually help us to expand the, the range of people participating and what they're actually able to do. So even as we've seen this happen, I think, and, and our partnership together certainly illustrates it, we're all struggling and sort of hitting up against the bounds of, great, we can put lots of stamps of names and this, this public entity and this private entity, and we're all collaborating, but our actual impact in terms of bringing more people into this space in, in a somewhat directed manner uh, is hard. And I think one of the major challenges when you talk about reassessment is not just what resources is the US government or any other entity putting into this, or for that matter, what are our goals? Because you look, and despite tremendous change in the region, uh, our goals are actually f fairly unchanged. A and the means that we have to do them are fairly unchanged. The question is, how do we take all of the energy that's out there and help channel it? And how do we use the platforms that you guys build certainly a lot better than we do uh, to bring those people in? I think that question needs to be a part of any reassessment because it's not just an exchange question. It's, it's a problem we're grappling with on every aspect of our foreign policy. How do we bring in this new sort of diffuse power uh, into a way that is going to not only advance our interests but help uh, with the mutual interests that have been here throughout, you know, certainly the, the focus of this term and, and previous administrations as well. Before I turn to um, our online moderator who has some questions I'd like to ask our other panelists, would you like to comment? Uh, Jackie, Maggie, Lucas? Go ahead, Jackie. I, I think that, um, that we're very late coming to this. It doesn't mean we can't throw the party and get people to come. But um, people have been communicating and, and um, you know, building things together through long distance. And the government has not really been a part of that. Mm -hmm. So I do think that there's some catch up to be played. And I'm thrilled to hear that there's the, the political will to do that. Um, I think that to really get to the bottom of what you're talking about, you need to get some different players at the table, like the ones that are, you know, the Google boys. Get some people from Amazon, the ones that really know what they're doing. They care about this country. They care about the world. And I think that they could bring some different knowledge to this on um, how, how it, it could play out. Um, well, on behalf of Partners for New Beginning, we would love to have you come right. to the table um, because I think it, it's exactly the right proposition. Uh, oh, I can't come. You. I'll send somebody that I know. But right, but right. I mean, <laughs> no, no, no. But I think that it's, I know. I think it's yeah. exactly the right proposition. Um, we need more of uh, those in that um, tech space. There's no question about it. And they could turn that fairly quickly, I think, if you got the right people at the table for the right mission. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great idea. Maggie? Just very quickly, I, I would like to get away from talking about the Arab Spring or even talking overtly about issues of the West and Islam and talk about STEM education. There is one thing that we have found, and we are even younger than Solia mm -hmm. at this, so we respect our elders. But there's one thing that unites Argentina, Brazil, Qatar, and the US. And that is getting kids smart, as Undersecretary Sonnenschein pointed out, on STEM. STEM. And focusing on STEM. And we incorporate A into STEM for those of us who were not very good at calculus but might have been better at the arts, because there is a way for people to access STEM through the arts. And this mm -hmm. is a great area, and we think it's fantastic and has a lot of promise. It's why we're doing climate change and connecting kids in the US with kids in Qatar and eventually Brazil on issues that they care about. Eventually, other topics come up. And that's why you have great moderators and facilitators who can handle how you have a conversation about something that you might end up disagreeing about. I don't want a world of convergence. That's boring. And it's probably not good for us, as I think brain studies have shown, smarter studies than I can articulate. I want a world of divergence, but divergence where we can respect that you and I don't agree, and we're OK. And it doesn't mean that I have to belittle you or demean you or act violently against you. 
And we elders haven't done a good job at showing our kids how to do that. So I go back to STEM. Get them smart on that, because it's a concern for every Ministry of Education around the world and for our own Department of Education. Good and you point. find common cause, and you let the other things happen with good moderators. Thank you. It's a good point. Uh, Lucas? Yeah, I, I'd love to. I, I thought the comments Adam made really framed the question in front of us very well in terms of how do we get from being essentially a, a bunch of different projects, if you will, to really being, I mean, the way I heard you is, is how do we establish a new field, really? And that it's a, it's, a, it's a robust field where there are standards, where there's a, you know, using Rebecca's term, I like this one, a currency of impact. Um, and, and there are models that are emerging where we're learning from each other. And there, there are dedicated funding lines where you know to go to. And there's a competition for getting those funding lines. And I, I think that is really where this needle tips, is when we get to that point. And as an organization that's been doing this work for you know, a decade now, about a couple years ago, we actually intentionally stopped trying to grow our program, in large part because of this challenge. Because we saw this is exactly what's happening, exactly what we just said. We're just running around asking for one grant here, one grant there, another project there, another project there. It's, it's not scalable. It's not sustainable in this way. We really need to be thinking more broadly about how do we establish this new field. And so that's why we as a coalition have come together. And trust me, we don't want to have that project-to-project -project framework either. You know, what, what we want to see is having these standard measurements so that there can be an assessment of what's working, what's not, we can be held accountable. We like to be held accountable. You know, we like moving from the intuition to evidence. We want that. And so I think that we as, an org we as a set of organizations are, are trying to do our part. We're, we're forming together to talk about, not about our Connect program. We're talking about virtual exchange. And, and so I think we're doing our part. And if there are other things we should be doing, I'd really honestly love to hear them because we, we think that we agree with you. That's what needs to happen. And I think what Adam is saying, and I don't, and I, if I don't mean to put words in your mouth, I think right now we need to convene all the stakeholders, the interested stakeholders, to really think the big ideas, to chart the next path. It's the foundations, it's the family foundations who are in this space on education, on virtual exchange. It's the big foundations, private sector, um, and our government colleagues to really look at the next the, a roadmap and chart a roadmap and try to have a convening of all the stakeholders, but not to dumb down the thinking, but to lift ourselves up, to think the big ideas, to turbocharge our um, um, thinking, and to have a true call to action tethered with a roadmap that says this is where we are going and stay the course. Yeah, if I could, if I could just expand a little bit, because uh, Andrew said something that made something click. And that is that, uh -uh. Uh, you know, right now, we, we got to take it to the next level. Got to take virtual yep. exchange to the next level. Right now, it's a feel-good kind of thing. Oh, this class talks to this class, and it's like demystifying the other. That's great. It's a nice-to-have. It's not a must-have. I mean, it's a must-have to us because we believe in it, but it's not a must-have to the rest of the world. So um, we got to establish a goal like, you know, like the Gates Foundation, when they say, look, our goal is to eliminate malaria. Right. Got it. Understood. We're with you. Our goal is to uh, what? Br bridge universities? I don't know. Have the a way, million students. Yeah. Well, the way Andrew put it, I thought was really good, uh, and we could elaborate that, but it is, what was it? To channel, channel young people's energy. That's what we're doing. We're channeling it in in a positive direction, whether it be in the STEM fields, whether it be in the uh, um, conflict resolution fields, whether it be whatever. So how do you take that idea and spin it out into a pithy global mission that everybody can have a piece of? So let me turn to, um, and I think we'll have more, Andrew, uh, opportunities so we can entertain some uh, online questions. Hi there. Um, a lot of great um, discussions around exactly the points you're discussing now, so I think there's some relevant questions to, for various pieces of the panel. I'll just um, outline a couple of questions. For the people in government, there's a question, what would you say to sovereign governments that see Exchange 2.0 simply as a backdoor for spreading U.S. policy and propaganda, that kind of suspicion? 
Um, to Lucas and perhaps other people on the panel, how important is deliberate Exchange 2.0 opportunities versus simply casual connections over social networks? And then related to that, what does success look like for you? You, you said a million people, but is it numbers of participants? Is it dollars? Is there an impact, an outcome, um, et cetera? So, go ahead. Well, the propaganda thing, I think the answer is easy, is, uh, you know, the, the, the best, the best uh, rejoinder to that is it's not government people participating in the exchanges. So it can't be propaganda. I mean, it could be uh, people's ideas, and, you know, that's... That ain't scripted. Andrew? I mean, I, I would just echo that. I think, look, we face this with physical exchanges, too. This is not a, a totally new world. Obviously, there's, there are more people participating, but the fact that it's unmediated by us, I think, if, only, you know, if anything, extends from the physical exchanges to a slightly less uh, conspiracy theory world. But the reality is, you know, this continues to be not just in practice, but in theory, you know, philosophically where we're committed. That exchange of ideas is something that represents America and that, we're, that we want to stand by. Uh, and there are governments around the world that don't want to do that, but the truth is that extends far, often that extends far beyond their willingness to work with us on, uh, on virtual exchanges to a whole host of other, you know, media freedom, access to the internet, all sorts of other stuff. And so th these are obviously a, ser a series of issues that we care very deeply about, um, but I'm not especially worried that in this particular realm, we're crossing into new territory. The one thing I, I did want to bring up that I think is somewhat related to this question is I still feel like the debate that we're having uh, is too focused around government. It's too focused around the big entities. Uh, and, and we're going back and forth on can we channel, uh, sorry, can we coalesce the, the offerings of the US government so it's more understandable to the outside world? Can we bring together the set of stakeholders who are major well-known institutions who might have expertise on it? The reality, and I, I don't mean to sound like a broken record on this, the coolest stuff in this space, the most impressive and interesting stuff, we rarely have anything to do with. And so this is across a whole spectrum of activities that we see, whether it is harnessing, again, this sort of collaborative power when disasters happen and people around the world are connecting across cultures and across borders to figure out how to respond to it. It is, uh, I mean, if, if you guys just did a poll of the people in your organizations who have Facebook friends in another place, this is happening in an unstructured way all the time. And I think we limit uh, how forward looking and how relevant we can be when it's all about what can the government contribute to this? Okay, what can major foundations? I think what we need to figure out how to do, Adam laid out that the US government is a catalyst, but the reality in this sort of environment now is that we're all catalysts, so that we can't depend simply on the programs that we, uh, that we are setting up. 60 years ago, 50 years ago, the Fulbright was a US government program because no other entity really had the resources to set these sorts of things up. That's not the world we live in anymore today. Then why are you still in this? So I'm going to be devil's advocate. So then what you're arguing against is that then you should unwind your role in setting up a virtual uh, technology unit. You really shouldn't because then what you're doing is you're overlapping. You're still playing in this space a little bit, but not enough to really be a stakeholder. So you, you got to either be in enough to say, okay, uh, we're going to sort of be the catalyst to help support um, and leverage resources, or we're going to really step out. So this is part of the problem. You're kind of, so why did you do a virtual technology? Well, I would say just one, I would edit what I said, which is rather than the catalyst, a, a catalyst. Because Andrew's got a point. I mean, there's just like, there is so much out there that we have absolutely no knowledge about and certainly no expertise in. So to presume that, to presume that we need to be the locus of this is presumptuous. Uh, the virtual exchange unit, let me just let me demystify it for you guys. It is basically, you know, uh, two camera people and a sound person with some machines. Uh, and what we're trying to do, and they're focused really on ECA, U.S. government people-to-people uh, -people exchange programs. They're not focused on stuff beyond that. And it is our own effort to what uh, we call in-house scaling and tailing 
our programs, i.e., in, or, in, in order to, uh, we, can't meet the, we can't meet the demand of people out there for our programs. People to people exchanges are 50,000. The demand is hundreds of thousands. So let us add a virtual dimension to our exchange program so we can expand our, ex meet the scale up to meet the demand, whether it be for English teaching, et cetera, et cetera. So that's number one. Number two, tail. Uh, increase the tail of our program so that after people participate in them, they can stay connected to us, they can stay connected to each other virtually, and, there, and thereby uh, <coughs> achieve what the professor in Montefia did without, without us. In other words, he was a Fulbrighter, right? Uh, if, we can, if we can successfully tail our programs or put a tail on our programs, the, the man or woman who we bring to the United States one of the 50,000 that we bring to the United States every year uh, will be engaged with his and her colleagues who also participate in the programs in out years virtually, and they'll come up with stuff. So this virtual unit just expands the scale and tail of ECA programs. Now, the challenge is, and this is where I think uh, the agenda setting comes in, is how do we marry what we're doing to what you're doing, create projects that are of sufficient scope and complexity that everybody would have a piece of it and we could pool our resources in a way that, that, that uh, significantly expands the impact. Uh, with this tiny little unit of you know, modest means uh, contributing to that. Tony, can I just jump in because you did lay out that dichotomy that I think needs yeah, sure. needs to be responded to. I, I think I think you somewhat set up a false dichotomy there. I don't think the choice for government uh, action across a whole sphere uh, uh, of sectors is whether we are all in or we're not in at all. I don't all. think it is. Uh, and the reality is, we have a strong strategic interest as a government in terms of channeling U.S. taxpayer money, not privately given money. Uh, towards these ends. And we've seen it time and time again how much these networks around the world are important to our strategic interests. You need to look no further than the last couple of months where people who have been a part uh, of these sorts of programs, whether physically or virtually, stand up for America in these places. This is incredibly important to us. And so because we're not able to set the terms of a debate, because we're not able to be the single uh, actor in any of these spheres, doesn't mean that we withdraw completely. I mean, I think we need to see the world as it is. I think we're deluding ourselves. If I were to say to you, you know what, Tony, you're right. We're going to be the players in this. I think it would just totally misdiagnose the state of the world today. And so we find ourselves in a middle zone where we can't withdraw because we have a meaningful role to, to play. But we can't control everything. And therefore, what we need to think about is with the modest resources that we have, how do those investments help spur uh, the best of America to help do this? And truthfully, the best of the global community to help build up these platforms. I think that... Um, much of what you do um, nurtures and incubates and has returned far beyond what um, is measurable in um, today but is measurable in tomorrow. And I, I think you're in some ways underestimating it. Um, I really believe that. And a lot of what you saw um, just in some of the snippets on the interaction with the students, um, Queen Noor mentioned uh, the uh, interaction with uh, and the absolute critical importance of the um, exchange, and it's not in sort of a multiple exchange between Arabs and Israelis. It is absolutely fundamental. If you do not engage in a people to people, because peace is, going to, is between people, it is not between governments. And if we don't do our work today and build on what happened um, tomorrow, we can't get to the day of peace. And I believe we still have that day before us. I believe it to my core. So I, I was creating the dichotomy to give you the opportunity to, because I, I believe that these are rich opportunities. And the issue of that, to address the question you posed uh, um, from the um, online question, the conspiracy theory. These are American values. We stand up. This is the essence of who we are. And um, conspiracies notwithstanding, look what happened in Pakistan last week. 
the, it is absolutely breathtaking to see the Pakistani people stand up on behalf of Malala. Uh, whoever would have thought? Uh, I wouldn't have. And it is really, this could well be, you know, a real turn, tipping point um, in Pakistan. So we need to watch that space. And it is, um, it's encouraging. But let's remember, it is about, she stood up for education. So... Do you, are there questions um, in the audience? For another couple questions from, that I think were about uh, you, social media and what's the difference between social media and, and outcomes, right, in terms of impact. Um, so, I, I mean, I think just to, to come back to those, I think those are important questions because I think very often we are still sort of stuck in some old categories in terms of how we think about the type of engagement we have in the world. There's either the sort of high-end physical exchange programs, which, which cost a lot and, and have a very deep impact. And then everything else is sort of relegated to, oh, it must be Twitter or, or you know, chat online, which is super cheap, high scale, but very little impact. And I think it's important that, first of all, we recognize some of the strengths of the social media, but also some of the limitations of it. And while, yes, it's a very powerful set of tools for mobilizing around a common theme, we saw that clearly in getting the first African-American president elected. We saw that in overthrowing entrenched dictators in the Middle East. But it's not a very good tool for connecting people across difference. In fact, if you see the, the chats that we have online, if you see the, the groups that form, they're generally attracted to a certain ideology. So it's very good for bringing like-minded people together and mobilizing around a particular cause. It's not as good for enabling constructive, nuanced, respectful discourse. And that is something that I think, as Andrew has said, is something that the government has a particular vested interest in. And I think it's important to acknowledge that while, yes, we do have modest resources and finite resources, the State Department is by far the largest funder of, of physical exchange programs in the world. And so if it takes a step into this arena, it can shape the way this field develops. So I think it's important to be realistic about that. And so I think that if the State Department were to make a meaningful and sustained commitment, as you're saying, over a 10-year period, saying this is a commit we're making, independent of the political ebbs and flows. As Andrew's saying, these priorities will remain the same. We are looking to promote our values. We're, we're looking to reach out. And I think that what the government's role is, it's not to, to bankroll this entire field. Mm -hmm. It's to fund those who wouldn't otherwise have these opportunities. If you could enable those students at Minifia University, or enable those students in Western Kentucky University, who aren't ever going to have those opportunities otherwise? What have you provided them with the virtual exchange scholarship funds? So we're not just investing more in the 1% to extend their experience abroad, but providing the other 99% with an opportunity. That's the game changer here. And so if we invested in those, then you could reach economies of scale. And this is where the catalyst role comes in. If the government provides that kind of funding, a scholarship funding, to reach underrepresented, marginalized youth, to provide them with those opportunities, mm -hmm. then we have some funding, frankly, to work with to increase our capacity to bring the cost per student down. And it's a much more appealing offer for the universities, for the end users, who are already paying us. But if they see the government making a big commitment, then I promise you the private sector will step up. I mean, look at a, a Cisco. It's an opportunity. Well, as I said, it's the good housekeeping seal of approval. It says, okay, they're in. Yeah. Well, but here's the thing. Here's what we would not want. Uh, not when I say we, I don't mean government. I mean the virtual exchange community. Mm. Uh, we accept you. You're thank in. you. Uh, what we would not want is the Cisco or the whatever, fill in the blank, the rich non-governmental people, to say, oh, well, since this, you guys. We're, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> and don't tell me Cutter's not rich. Uh, but hey, what we would not. I checked I wasn't the minister of finance. Yeah, so. But anyway, uh, what we would not want is for the Maggie. Cisco and the rich people to say, well, since the government's doing it, we don't need to. Because we are a drop in the bucket. I don't think anybody sees no, that, I Adam, and that's the essence of the a public-private partnership. Yeah, but if, you know, <laughs> Adam, I think that's old think. I'm going to challenge you. I, but I, okay, you, it's old think, but I'm the, I'm the guy who has to do the budget, and I'm the guy who hears about public-private partnerships, and I don't see the dollars. But your idea dollars. of a public-private partnership is you Fulbright want... Fulbright could get cut 
The only reason this gonna, Fulbright's going to stay around is because foreign governments are putting money into it. Yeah. And that's the level of, when we say public-private partnership, we don't mean spirit moral support. We don't mean uh, in-kind support. Right. We mean money to support scholarships. Money. So uh, if we go to the Hill and say, hey, listen, we got this great program for $10 million for X number of virtual scholarships, that $10 million will buy $10 million. But if Cisco and others or whoever come in with another $10 million, well, then we got $20 million for twice as many scholarships. If you wanted to take a meeting at Cisco with us, I'd, I'd go in with you. OK. <laughs> but that's so why you have, have, you have, have to have, have that vision thing. What are we trying to do? And you have to have the clarity so that it's not scholarship for this today, something for that tomorrow, something for that the day after. And that's where you, know, you can't have the you know, ricochet. You've got to have this this sense of, okay, these are our top five priorities, and this is what we're going to do. This is what we're doing in this region. This is what we're doing in these priorities, and just stay the course. And so I think that's why you do have to have a, a convening of the big ideas and the rethinking and where you are on, region, on, on the regions. I mean, I think one of the colleagues talking about Brazil, you know, going into looking at the opportunities not only of a Brazil from an entrepreneurship looking at the upcoming Olympics, there are huge opportunities um, to think about connectivity in Brazil and how do you tee that up early on, not just after the fact. Um, so, but you got to do sort of the planning and the thinking. And frankly, the large foundations, have, have, they are, they're not resilient. Their planning goes, uh, you know, years and years and years in advance. So um, that's why you have to sit and plan out. Um, in some cases, sometimes the government, frankly, has a little bit more resiliency than some of the big foundations. They're locked in five years out sometimes. So um, would, I'd like to entertain some questions from the audience. It sounds to me like you're talking about an Aspen Institute forum to bring the mm -hmm. leaders from the play, from the various stakeholders to come together and I think that that is probably the next step. Yeah. I actually have a note. <laughs> but, no, no, but I think it is a convening uh, of the various players. And you have to do it at that level. Yeah, you do. You have to have it at the principal. Right. The principals. Thank you, though, for clarifying that. I appreciate it. Yes? Can you identify yourself, please? Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Kathy Healy. I'm a uh, My name is Kathy Healy. I am a um, cross-cultural exchange liaison at Cesar Chavez Prep Charter School here in D.C., and I'm on the advisory board of Iron USA. Uh, Lucas, I noticed that you said that you are curriculum-based. I'm wondering how your program is curriculum based, where it fits in to college and university curriculums. I'm happy to give, I, I can do a very brief answer to that and I'd love to talk to you further. Um, I, don't, I think probably want to stay at the field level as much as possible. I think all of our programs are embedded in curriculum in different ways. Ours is basically about a third of the student's grade. So students who are taking a class, and Cynthia Schneider's class was here earlier, um, are each assigned to a group that they meet through our website every week at a designated time with eight other students from different universities around the world. They engage in two hours of facilitated discourse, and they come back in their class and talk about their experiences, their projects they do that they then get graded upon. Um, so there are a number of different ways, and I think you know, Global Nomads Group and IRON have different answers to that question, but each of ours are embedded in curricula in different ways. Uh, yes, sir? <coughs> Uh, I'm Derek Cogburn, and let me just uh, say a little bit about what I do, and I'll get to the question. So I'm a professor at American University, and I direct uh, a research center that's a joint center between Syracuse and American University that studies technology-enhanced learning communities. And we've been doing this for 13 years. We, between South Africa and the U.S., we uh, started in 1999 with a global synchronous virtual graduate seminar between six universities, three in the U.S., three in South Africa, We've published a lot about this. You know, we've done a lot in this space. 
what we're doing now, and I really appreciate the way you frame this, um, we have a five-year program that's funded by the Nippon Foundation uh, out of Tokyo. It's a fairly sizable program. It's about $2 million a year, and it focuses on a virtual master's degree between um, uh, American University uh, focused on uh, Southeast Asia and students with disabilities. Uh, and so the secretary talked about uh, accessibility as well. So we just graduated our first cohort of master's students from Southeast Asia, from Vietnam, Cambodia, uh, the Philippines, and Singapore. We've taken on our second cohort, and there were 10 students in the first cohort, and seven graduated. Uh, we've just taken on our second cohort. We have 12 students that has students from Malaysia, Indonesia, um, uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, plus uh, uh, Nigeria, Kenya, uh, the U and two from the U.S., from Sri Lanka and Mexico. Uh, again, we've been studying this, we've been writing about this, and so forth. So my question is similar to the gentleman's here is, and I've been looking through the materials, and I'm assuming this is why I was invited, but I'm trying to figure out what's the next step. I mean, we've been doing this, we've been working in this, we're not we don't have our hand out looking for resources, we're just doing it, we're writing about it. <laughs> Similar to Rebecca, we're studying it, we've got great measures, we've got great data. Okay, <laughs> what's next? What do we do? So how do we get involved? Is this Exchange 2.0 something people can get involved with, or is it only the four or five groups that have already been working together? What's next? I'm excited. You know, you're preaching to the choir. What do we do? Well, um, from my perspective, I would like to see the Exchange Point 2.0 coalition expanded, number one. Number two, what I hear is we need a convening for the next step um, to really reach out. I was struck by Tara's, um, and uh, Adam, I don't know if you can speak to this, um, this uh, college um, mm. Uh, virtual college fair that she's doing and it caught my attention in terms of how do we lash that up with the um, Exchange 2.0 and not miss that opportunity. I mean, we <coughs> have um, some Exchange uh, 2.0 and, and also university partnerships um, embedded in that, um, uh, you know, university college uh, fair piece. But um, I think if we could, well, I'd like all of our panelists and to address it, and I'd like Jackie also to be interested to hear your thoughts. But Jackie, do you want to, yeah, from well, a, that, your perspective? Yeah, I think that one of the things we just need to capitalize on, and, and you obviously are at your university and, and trying to push the scale of it, but I think as, an, as a nation, we need to capitalize on this. People are already connected. I mean, we all know that, right? And um, we work with uh, children kindergarten through 12th grade. And I can tell you that along with Global Nomads, after the, um, the uh, earthquake in Japan and the tsunami, we put out a call for little origami paper cranes. You know, you send me a paper crane, we donate $2 to Japan to rebuild schools and youth centers. And we put a, a, you know, a, an emotional level up there. We said, OK, we'll hope to get 100,000 cranes. We got two million paper cranes. Now, if that doesn't tell you something from 40 countries and all 50 states, young people want to take action collectively. They really like being you know, connected. They're very social animals. Um, we need to take advantage of that and, and make it happen. And if we aren't the ones that are going to do this and step up and do it in some way, somebody else is going to. And then it's going to be much harder for us. It may not be as positive. It may not be as positive. So I think if you have a convening, maybe rather than feeling like a catalyst, maybe you guys are the conveners, right? Um, but you get a bunch of different kinds of, of minds around the table and invite Rebecca to figure out what's going on inside those minds. <laughs> and, and we need and, you, Rebecca. And have them, you know. Yeah, no, I think out. it's very interesting. But don't let them out the door until they've come to a, you know, an action plan. No, I totally see. So exactly. Yeah, we need action let plans them out. here. Out yeah, um, just before Concrete. I call on, I'd like Lucas and Adam to um, also address this. Uh, well, two, two points. One is clearly one of the ideas that's emerged out of this conversation that, that I've taken away is the idea of virtual scholarships. So, you know, we need to noodle that. You've got your model. There are thousands of different models. Is it, yours is a two, years, two year or one year master's? One year master's. Uh, you know, there are different permutations. So virtual, it's great that you're doing it. And it's, you've got 
you can add to that. Uh, you can contribute to the generating of ideas and possibilities. Uh, on the educational advising front, I mean, this is this is a uh, this is a strategic priority for the State Department. Uh, education, higher education in the United States is the is the fifth largest uh, service sector export. In, in the services sector of the American economy, higher education is the fifth largest export, or ex export of the United States. It's a $21 billion a year industry. There are 750,000 foreign students studying in the United States. This is a major economic driver uh, for our communities. So we in ECA, uh, want to expand the number of, of foreigners studying in the United States. So we have a network of educational advisors in 400 different places around the world trying to uh, attract, well, educate, inform, and attract foreign students to study in the United States. We do it through online communities, blah, blah, blah. Uh, one of the new ideas that Tara mentioned, just to get to the point that you're making, is we are going to have, a on International Education Week, a virtual education fair. So that we're online, we've got 200 colleges participating online for 24 hours, and it is, you know, a sort of, you know, available, a must participate in event for people around the world. You can just dial in or tap in or whatever you do and uh, get information about studying in the United States. Uh, it's innovative. It's a one-off. Uh, we're we're gonna see where it goes and see what else we can do with it, but. It's basically uh, an attempt, uh, an outreach attempt. But we need to make sure American University and all the universities that are in this space, and Syracuse, and you may yeah, recall my guess our is colleague, AU is Jim in Steinberg, it. was, yeah. you know, we've got connectivity. We have to make sure the people, the players, and, and virtual uh, needs to be in there. So if we could make sure we have, and we should be leveraging, we should be informing our partners. So give us the information. Let us get out information to our, our partners on this space. Let me just say one concrete response to the question, too, in terms of how can you get engaged. And you're absolutely right. It's something, in terms of our coalition at this point, has been very small. It's basically the three organizations here who have been, frankly, because, I mean, we're doing this, you know, with, until very recently, no funding to do this. It's basically been, you know, on our own time making this work. And just for the sake of trying to be strategic and, and coordinating, we've kept it to just three of our organizations. But now, frankly, thanks to the support of the Cutler Foundation International, a big part of that grant is really investing in the establishment of that field so that we can put up a website, we can open our doors to expand the, 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 the coalition. And so I'd encourage you, if we can connect afterwards, we, we very much are eager to expand the group, a part of that conversation. There are a number of great organizations, like uh, I think Jess Remington's here, who does One World Youth, which does great work. Um, and I think Shanti Shoji might be here also. Who, you know, Two great organizations that are also doing this, which we're eager to begin working with. We, we know we're not the only ones doing this kind of work. So this woman in the middle in the blue. Hi, thank you. My name is Karen. I work for a local nonprofit here, and we do educational exchanges on a variety of level. So it's very interesting for me. Thank you so much for what you've shared. One of the things I keep coming back to is access, though, and capacity building for those who don't have access to things that, that make virtual exchange. Having been a Peace Corps volunteer overseas, that was one of the great things that I ran into is, you know, trying to get people connected with that, and there just wasn't the local capacity for them to participate. And so a lot of the things that we're talking about in these exchanges end up sort of attracting a certain level of people, you know, the middle to upper income people who do have access. So I guess I'm just curious on your mind as you as you think as you're moving forward to 2.0, what about those people who don't have the everyday normal easy access? And you know, what are you doing in maybe some of your programs and how are you infusing that, especially the underserved Americans? You know, who even maybe don't even have a computer in their middle school or elementary school, let alone internationally, and not even have access maybe to anything more than a cell phone. And what are your plans, you know, as far as a coalition for those type of people? Because that's your everyday person. That's your person who's selling, who's buying, who's having conversations, who's raising children that will become the citizens of the future. I'm happy to Lucas? speak to that. Um, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. There are clearly many people who do not have that access currently. 
I also think it's important to point out, though, that there have been pretty extraordinary investments in increasing connectivity. And the gap between the number of people who are having profound cross-cultural experiences as part of their education and those who have access to those tools currently, or could for a very low amount of money, like at Minifia University, we just you know, got the Egyptian government to contribute 14 computers to them, which I think cost them about you know, something on the order of $7,000 or something. So it's increasingly this is a, a resource issue and a very, relatively speaking, small resource issue. But even if you're just looking at the gap between how many students have a cross-cultural experience as part of their education, you know, in the United States, it's 1% of, of higher education students. And how many have access to a computer? So there's about, you know, tens of millions of students that are in that gap that we could be working with now. And so hopefully, yes, we could do more. This is clearly not the answer to all of our problems. It's not going to necessarily address, you know, cure cancer or anything to that effect. But it, but it can provide people with, there are, there's a huge group of people out there who have the access but aren't having the content or the experience through those tools. And that's, that's where we see ourselves as stepping in. Um, can I just add, uh, we, uh, Cutter Foundation International focuses on largely underserved communities in the United States and connecting them to similar communities in Brazil and to Qatar, where the issues are somewhat different. Um, there is an issue with access, you're absolutely right. And um, so what we try to do, and we're small, is provide computers to the schools that need them for a language lab, and then we don't restrict the access to the computers. So they can use it for language lab, they can use it for anything. We just ask that it be for educational purposes. Um, I, I would like to use that point to hook back into what are we doing? So. There's a lot of very good talk about driving more kids overseas into US schools, which is great, but I don't really care. What I care about is K to 12 connecting classrooms. I think that's what we care about. I like that definition of virtual. I think we can all decide within virtual what virtual means to each of us and have different niches, but we need to have an architect sort of draw the master plan for this space, and it's gonna be hardware companies, you know, the companies, we work with Intel, uh, which is not hardware, it's the software side, but we work with them on Khan Academy, so we trans we're translating Khan Academy videos into Arabic. They will be installed on Intel-powered computers in the Middle East. So it's looking at how you draw lines, not always for the classroom-to-classroom -classroom exchange itself, but for the content, the information, and again, I go back to STEM, because when we're talking to state and the NSC, I go back to ministries of education. There are shared concerns, and whether it's higher education or K-12, to you can find that community of concerns. You can draw that, those circles and say, this is what we will all agree to work on. You know, Maybe the first year we start with 10th grade biology. We started small. You start small, you figure out the kinks along the way, and you grow it. You also have to not be afraid to fail, and I'm sorry, but governments don't like to fail. And that's where, again, I think it's going to take this consortium of all of us looking at that goal of its 10 million students in three years connected in science classrooms, K to 12, and then maybe there's a separate higher education goal. What that is, we're driving towards it. We're going to stumble on the way. We're going to learn from our mistakes because you're putting together a consortium. Where we'll share those lessons learned, and we'll keep moving forward. It's about global citizenship. It is. It's about a kid studying their biology homework and knowing that there's a kid halfway around the world who's got the same questions that they're answering on their homework because you just saw them in class. And making that real, we talk about these concepts all the time. We throw out these words, we come up with great jargon, and what does it mean practically? And so I'm, I'm sorry to bring us back to that, I just wanted to use that hook because I think that, that focus on access, what are we giving them access for? And how do we channel that and bring all these partners together in the different capacities they have and challenge them to meet that, whatever, if it's a numerical challenge or classroom challenge, they'll do it. It's, it's also about the cultural exchange. You know, like what we're doing with Global <coughs> Nomads right now is between the Democratic Republic of Congo, Somalia, and the US. And it's in that exchange of being able to see how other people live in other parts of the world and yet 
have, have a, a common ground also, which there's a lot of common ground once they, you know, once they get over the shyness, it's you know, all common ground. Um, but it also kind of flips the learning um, table a little bit. You know, people in, in developed countries think we know it all. Well, we don't. And it's very obvious when that happens, when it's a person, a young man in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo that is teaching a student in the US how to do something. So that, that's what we need also for, for understanding that we're all more alike and on the basic level, what I want for my grandchildren is probably what you want for your children, because you can't possibly have grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> You're too young. Both of you, it's very, very well said and brings us back to a very good point. Shamal, you've been patient. Does someone have a microphone for Shamal? <laughs> uh, well, I, uh, you know, I think this is great in the participation, everybody who's played a leadership role in this. I think the, um, I, the thing that concerns me, one of the things that concerns me a lot is going back to a point that my colleague Lucas made about what are we talking about in terms of the definition. Now, the definition that the current members of the coalition came up with may not be the be all and end all. A lot of thought went into it, but the definition was about, uh, first the goal was about making it the norm that young people have a profound international cross-cultural experience as part of their education. Not every distance education project, not every online project, not everything falls into that. And I think the more that you conflate and, and make blurry and put in a lot of different kinds of ideas, it doesn't mean that those ideas aren't good or those projects aren't good, but we will fail uh, that convening if we're not really focused. The big idea should be how to pay, take something that really works and is focused and scale it, not how to take it, take everything online that's kind of good and make more of it. And so I, I would urge I, that you go with that definition or you argue that's the wrong definition, here's another one, but let's have that back and forth. Right now the definition that we've come up with in our conversations, even though we have really different models of programming, is technology enabled, facilitated, whether it's by a teacher in your model or a volunteer in our model, whatever, sustained and curriculum based and curriculum based doesn't mean it has to be in a classroom but it means there's a pedagogy it's not just uh, online web chat uh, and that goes to the second point which is I I'm you know we invited Rebecca down here and you know uh, she came all the way down this morning and I'm so thrilled with why she came down I'm concerned that we're losing the relevance of what she talked about the reason that that definition was important the reason that her presentation is important is she's talking about she just made a case for this is what we should be measuring actually in all exchange programs. And there are players in here who've had more experience than I have in exchange who might want to argue self-other overlap isn't what we should be measuring. You know, those skills for collaborative problem solving across cultures isn't what we should be measuring. But we've made a case that that's what we should be measuring. And if we should be measuring that, no matter what kind of exchange we're doing, virtual or physical, then I would ask you, should we not be comparing programs on how they do on those measures? Or if those aren't the right measures, come up with other <coughs> ones. But the purpose is to compare them. And it's not to have a zero sum between virtual and physical. But it is to have a zero sum between things that work and things that don't. That means bad physical exchange programs as well as bad virtual exchange programs should adapt or get out. And good physical exchange programs and good virtual exchange programs should be scaled and invested in. And I think we really need to be focused on the definitions and the impact we're trying to have and not lump in everything that's good in an online space. So that's my only encouragement to the, to the panel. Shamo, I think um, that your clarification on both the definition and reminding us, I'm thinking about Rebecca's um, circles, um, are very important as you measured um, what worked and what didn't and the simplicity of moving the circles together um, is a very, very important and good reminder. We, I think, we took for granted some of the, the synergies and agreement as we get, began this conversation. So it's a good reminder uh, to bring us back to um, some of those um, key principles because um, I think there's a recognition that um, there is a relationship to um, existing physical and, and to complement the virtual. The question is in today's um, space and our conversation, how do we complement um, these two in a today's world and get um, a, the clarity of an action plan? You gave us the definition. I think it is your workable definition. I feel very comfortable with that definition. Jackie and Maggie 
brought us back to the reality of um, sort of the STEM piece and what happens in that classroom space and the exchange and the, um, the, the, the technology uh, piece together with the cultural and the meaningful um, exchange of the cultural um, interaction um, that needs to take place. This is important work. And we need to remind ourselves um, that it is important. And Andrew, one of the things on, on the, the money piece that I am reminded by, and probably, um, so when I worked on Capitol Hill, um, Charlie Wilson was there. And his office was just down the hall from me. And he used to chase after his cat. And it, it, I don't know if you remember the movie, well, Charlie Wilson's War. And it, I mean, it really does do, uh, I mean, it's very true. But we should all watch it again and again and again. Because at the end of the day, you know, he reminds us, um, members of Congress at the time were very willing, he pushed the envelope on the security assistance component um, that uh, was under consideration at the time. Um, but then when you began to pull back on the military space and had to, to actually support the real work of nation building and education, well, it became a little messy. So in today's world, we're talking about now that next space that you have to introduce not only institution building and education, but <coughs> now you have the issue of um, the good of technology and social media, but you also have this untethered social media that if it's not channeled, and as Shamo, you've just pointed out, we have to remind ourselves of the definition of what we're trying to do and what we're trying to accomplish here so that we can leverage in a very positive and meaningful way. So thank you for that. I, I really appreciate it. Yes, you've been very patient, so thank you. Thank you for all your comments. Uh, I'm Yelena Turnov with the Interactivity Foundation, and we do very much uh, what you do. We promote policy discussions, thoughtful uh, policy discussions among citizens, and work with uni universities on student-centered discussion in STEM fields also, and uh, promote the um, development of policy possibilities in the classroom. Uh, and did studies on them, over a thousand responses, so I want to talk with Rebecca afterwards. But my qu question would be to, and comment to what Adam said earlier, and it seems everybody is attracted to this idea to chart a big path, um, how to move forward, how to uh, put together resources in one uh, big path. And I think, uh, there is a danger in that, that when you ch that you get locked into one conceptual framework and you can miss many other great opportunities. So I just would like to encourage, if such path will be charted, consider several paths, several big ideas. Thank you. Tony, if I could just add to that. I mean, I think one of the important parts of having, again, Rebecca's work here today, and one of the reasons why we're focusing on, let's focus on the outcomes. Mm -hmm. Let's not get caught up in what the means are. Let's, let's be clear exactly. about what are we trying to achieve, and let's be open to different methodologies of achieving mm -hmm. those outcomes. And so I think that is very much, you know, in terms of what defines Exchange 2.0 to us. It's, it's not even, it's in part, yes, harnessing the full set of technologies and tools to achieve those ends, using whatever tools are available, but it's also being very focused on results and actually having accountability to those results. And as Shamil said, you know, making sure the ones that don't meet those results either adapt or go away. So, so I think that is really important. And I, I also want to, I think you're, you're, you're right about a path. We need to be realistic about involving so many different partners towards a goal how well can we coordinate all that? I do think there are key principles, though, that are important for us to keep in mind in terms of what is, what is our role. As practitioners, I, I think we should continue to be challenged to implement, innovate, try and figure out new ways to do more with less, be held to high standards. And 
I think, though, that it's also important that those who have in government the ability to draw attention to those, or those who have the ability to, to marshal taxpayer resources to those types of programs, aren't necessarily trying to run programs themselves, but are instead trying to empower those who can. And so that's one of the things that, as we look at the road forward, I think we can identify some key principles along those lines that will help us all sort of move forward in parallel, at least, to, to meet those needs. I think we need to be resilient, but we have to do. Yeah. We have to do. We just can't, you know, always be, af you know, afraid to, to make some changes and make some adjustments um, because I think that, that we have... We've done, I think we've come a long way. I think, Adam, you, you commented on that, and, and we have, and you all have done, uh, we have just tried to facilitate uh, and call attention to your work and bring supporters um, to, to the table um, in every way we can. So, um, I, but I am impressed with, um, in a very sh short uh, period of time, but there is a sense of urgency um, to the work at hand, uh, and there should be. So, yes. Thank you very much to everyone who has spoken today. My name is Henry Shepard, and I have the pleasure of working at Solia with the people that you're seeing here today. Um, I just want to speak a little bit to some of the points about technology and what's already happening in the world that we can't control. I've been really lucky to work on the fellowship at Solia, which is basically 100 co-catalysts who are already doing this work. They're a bit older than university students, and they're already on the ground from Morocco to Indonesia trying to make change in the scale that, that, that's around them. And I just want to say all of them know more about tech than I do. And all of them and, and everyone else here has a thousand people that we know who right now all we know how to do is like a photograph. So the doing, ex you know, on, fa and on Facebook, you see a lot of uh, the posters, the anti-Islam posters in the New York subway. There are a lot of people taking action to uh, speak out against it. But we haven't managed to scale a substantive way to do that. We haven't found young people, haven't found a way to actually coalesce around a movement that speaks out against hatred. I think you're seeing a lot of fragmented responses. And so what I would say about bringing in people who are more tech savvy and bringing in people who can really be co-catalysts so that we're not dictating a movement is to make people all over the world, and I'm not talking about every single person, I'm talking about the ones who are already doing it and need partners, and we're here to be partners with them. I think that finding a way to link up with them and and really kind of jump on the same comet that they're trying to be on themselves is going to be a really powerful way to make sure that we're not doing something that just gets superseded the moment that someone invents a new way to crowdsource something or a new way to like a photograph or share a photograph for that matter. Thank you. So I think we have time for one more question. Go ahead. Back. Well, we, uh, we'll take it. Hi, I'm Tanya. I'm with um, AFS Intercultural Program, so I represent one of the physical exchange organizations. And I had the a good fortune and honor of working with Global Nomads Group before that. So I guess I'm just wondering on the panel what all of you feel, or maybe one of you should, should respond, about per perhaps it would be good at the next convening if we have someone from the Fulbright or from AFS or someone who's from physical exchange to really show how we can work together in this hybrid approach because we're, conv we're talking about the converted, but there's a lot of people who will never really get on the bandwagon on virtual because I'm part of the physical now and I see that other world. So it's just really someone who's passionate about both is just trying to understand how we can marry better. Thank you. Tony, can I just of jump course. in on that? Um, I'll say something that, that I think will maybe be a little bit of a bomb at the end of this session. Um, <laughs> hey, Andrew. <laughs> why not? You know, why not? End of this. Um, you know, everybody says this is not a zero-sum game and that everyone can win and <clears throat> all of that. And the reality, having lived through the congressional budget cycle many times, is it is a zero-sum game. Uh, or it's something close to a zero-sum game. And, and truthfully, ECA has weathered that storm as well as or better than any other entity in the federal government when it comes to keeping uh, the budget at least flat or up over the last number of years. And, and uh, you know, that can't always be the case. But I, I think what we need to think about here, and this is partially because I really believe it and partially for the sake of being somewhat provocative within this community, goes back to 
what Shama was saying a little bit, which is at the end of the day, in terms of our stewardship of US taxpayer resources, we should not be beholden to uh, any particular groups, any particular programs that we've grown attached to over time, but simply where can we have the most impact with those resources? And so I think the question becomes, how do we build that portfolio, right? I mean, we've, we already have it spread over a number of things, but what in our portfolio does different things for us? When you look at sort of per capita costs per person impacted versus what are we actually getting in terms of the scale of that impact, we know these vary across all of our programs, but we need to not be shy about, uh, as, as we should be with every item uh, in our budget, about making sure that we're getting the most return on the investment for each of those. And so we know, for example, or I think a lot of people think, that in-person exchanges have higher impact, right? They stay with people for longer. That may indeed be true, but that's not actually the metric that matters most when you're looking at allocating money. What matters the most, and you have to balance this across a whole number of factors, is what impact are you getting per money, you know, per dollar spent? And so I think we need to be careful about that because this goes back to the initial question about what role can we play? We may have modest resources, but the reality is we have committed to this, and you've seen tremendous growth in this field even over the last four years that I've been in the government, and I, I know before that. Uh, the question is, where can we invest those in the smartest way? And so I think it's not really a question of physical versus not, whether they complement or not. It's a question of, with limited resources, what we do that can invest that money in the highest impact way. And I think that does go back to the question of evaluation of the impact. It goes back to the question, honestly, of, uh, of having an honest debate in this city uh, with Capitol Hill about where these programs can truly have impact and, and being able to truly uh, you know, assert that to the Hill and, and have facts to back it up. And I know that should hopefully cause some sort of an arms race within the inside the Beltway community for everyone trying to prove the impact of their programs. And that's great. We would all love to see that. Um, but that's our perspective. And I think on that, we may even disagree with, with ECA uh, in some places. But I think we broadly agree on that concept about what we're there to do. And, and that catalytic role is not just you know, in where we come down on that debate, but how those investments, back to Tony's point, can jumpstart this whole sort of industry to get people involved regardless of who they are and where they are. Um, and the last thing, you know, just to throw the other bomb is thinking about where this fits in with the broader set of national security priorities. And so we go back to, you know, Shamal's point about let's not let this be confused with every other virtual thing we're doing. And, and the way our budget works, it's, it's not. But the way our time works in terms of that being zero sum, we do need to recognize that this competes with a whole host of other things. So if we are, to Tony's point, looking for public-private partnerships that have impact, we can't go with a 1,000 different proposals to Intel. And so then the question becomes, is, where does cross-cultural education and uh, exchange stack up against you know, uh, direct STEM education provision and these other sorts of online interactive programs where people can be getting degrees and building harder skills that might help them in their own labor forces. Again, these are not necessarily mutually exclusive, but it's helpful to take the perspective, you know, not just within this room, that we're juggling a number of competing priorities and what we need the help on is people coming and, and helping us to understand where those trade-offs truly are. Because we are going to the intels of the world and not just saying, hey, we'd like to set up a platform that enables people to talk to each other. But with all of the amazing stuff that's going on in education technology today, we'd also like to make sure that people around the world are not just being able to talk to each other, but gaining the skills that they need in their own local environments. That's in our national security interest just as much, uh, and we could have a debate about where they stack up, but just as much as people talking to each other and understanding each other. And so I, I think, you know, sometimes these debates get increasingly insular. For us to have the most impact, we need to take the step back and recognize where and how those resources are truly being allocated. So I'm going to take the prerogative of the chair and um, add a probably a very controversial um, end to this conversation. So Andrew, you talked about the issue of national security priorities. And I think that as we look at um, the entire conversation and um, reflecting on where we are in terms of budget priorities, and um, I happen to feel very strongly that public-private partnerships are the new paradigm shift. They are a very effective tool um, to leverage both policy um, and uh, budget uh, leveraging resources and are impactful. 
I think it's time for us to look at a merged national security budget, an 050-150 budget. As long as you are looking at the diminished resources of a narrow sliver of a State Department 150 budget against an 050 budget, you're never going to have a true global national security budget. So as we look to the future, I think that that is something that we all need to put on the table. And um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that isn't put on the table um, following November 6th, as the Congress reconvenes and we get through our election, because it's in that context that you really can address a national security uh, conversation with an underpinning of a rational budget priority. So I'm not asking you to comment on it. I'm just um, going to just put that on the table. So let me um, offer a couple thoughts. First of all, I want to thank everyone for joining us. It was an extraordinary conversation. I want to thank our panelists. And um, I learned a great deal. And uh, it was a very rich uh, and impactful conversation. So, um, and we have a lot of takeaways, which for me is um, a good thing. And I, on our part, uh, both in the context of um, the work I do um, on the Arab-Israeli uh, issue and our public-private partnership, this is very much in the sweet spot. So thank you for enlightening me, and, and I very much uh, look forward to staying uh, engaged. So thank you very much. Sheldon, back to you. Well, on behalf of USIP, thank you for an outstanding panel. Tony, thank you for moderating an outstanding 90 minutes. Just wonderful. Um, between this outstanding panel, between Queen Nora's comments in the beginning, Rebecca Sachs's presentation, uh, Under Secretary Tara Sonnenschein, um, I really feel as if I know what Einstein's chauffeur must have felt like moving us from one speaker to the next. Um, if there's Two things that are really clear coming out of this conversation. One, it is that this topic of virtual exchanges is all of our issue. Um, practitioners, universities, schools, uh, USIP, Department of Education, Department of State, uh, and parents. Um, parents need to start to expect and demand opportunities like this for the kids. That's what I actually believe is when we're going to start seeing that you know, everyone having this cross-cultural experience is when parents really step up to the plate and start asking for it. Uh, and finally, that this conversation is really just beginning. We are just getting traction around this, so I'm looking forward to it in the future. Uh, anything you wanted to add to this conversation, Queen Nora? I don't want to. I don't want to call you out, but you've been patiently here for three hours. So, is there anything you'd like to add? expand the diversity of the partners of this so you bring in perhaps some of the people representing what may be going on in other cultural and regional um, areas. I don't think this, that what is happening here, which is phenomenal, is unique to what is being thought about throughout the world. And you all represent networks of people around the world, so you've incorporated that in the discussion. So I think it would be great have some voices, and our friend in Egypt is uh, right. extraordinary, but to have some brainstorming, uh, uh, some other voices representing well said. So for those of you who could not hear, the, the uh, Queen Nora was suggesting, next time we have this conversation, we need to expand the circle, especially internationally, if I'm uh, reading you correctly, especially internationally, because this is a good start, but there's a lot of people with a lot of interest in, in helping to move this conversation forward. Um, thank you. Uh, there is a reception outside sponsored by the Exchange 2.0 Coalition, so please join us there, and thank you all again. <laughs>